General Preface and Preface to Volume 1 of Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1. General Preface and Preface to Volume 1. General Preface. The present work is intended as a comprehensive account of medieval times, drawn up on the same lines as the Cambridge modern history, but with a few improvements of detail suggested by experience. It is intended partly for the general reader, as a clear and, as far as possible, interesting narrative, partly for the student, as a summary of ascertained facts, with indications, not discussions, of disputed points, partly as a book of reference, containing all that can reasonably be required in a comprehensive book of general history. A full bibliography is added to every chapter, and a portfolio of illustrative maps is published to accompany each volume. There is nothing in the English language resembling the present work. Germany, indeed, has Heckrin and Unken, but in France even the great work of Lévy and Rambaud deals with the Middle Ages on a much smaller scale than is here contemplated. The present volumes are intended to cover the entire field of European medieval history, so that in every chapter a specialist sums up recent research upon the subject. America, France, Germany, Austria, Bulgaria, Hungary, Italy, Spain, and Russia are represented in the list of contributors. The principles on which the work is constructed were laid down by the late Lord Acton for the Cambridge Modern History. Professor Burry, Lord Acton's successor as Regius Professor of Modern History, was invited by the syndics of the press to plan the history as a whole and to draw up the scheme of each volume. The first editors appointed were the Rev. H. M. Guatkin, M. A., Dixie Professor of Ecclesiastical History, Miss Mary Bateson and Mr. G. T. Lapsey, M.A. Fellow of Trinity College. On Miss Bateson's death, the Rev. J. P. Whitney, B.D. of King's College, was appointed in her stead. But on Mr. Lapsey's retirement through ill health, happily only temporary, his place was not filled up. The present editors are therefore Professor Watkin and Mr. Whitney. They wish to place on record their grateful thanks for the helpful advice which Professor Burry has always been ready to give them when requested. But it should be understood that the editors are alone responsible for the matter contained in each volume, for the selection of the writers of the various chapters, and for the general treatment of the subjects discussed. It is hoped to publish two volumes yearly in regular succession. September 1911 Preface to Volume 1. The present volume covers a space of about 200 years, beginning with Constantine and stopping a little short of Justinian. At its opening, the Roman Empire is standing in its ancient majesty, drawing new strength from the reforms of Diocletian and the statesmanship of Constantine. At its close, the empire has vanished from the west, while the east is slowly recovering from the pressure of the barbarians in the 5th century and gathering strength for Justinian's wars of conquest. At its opening, heathenism is still a mighty power. Society is built up on heathen pride of class, and Rome still seems the center of the world. At its ending, we see Christianity supreme, Constantinople the seat of power, and the old heathen order of society in the West, dissolving in the confusion of barbarian devastations. At its opening, Caesar's will is law from the Atlantic to Armenia. At its ending, a great system of Teutonic and Aryan kingdoms in the West has just been grievously shaken by the conversion of the Franks from heathenism direct to orthodoxy. In our first chapter, we trace the rise of Constantine, his reunion of the empire, his conversion to Christianity, the political side of the Nicene Council, and the foundation of Constantinople. Then follows Dr. Reed's account of the reforms of Diocletian and Constantine, which fixed for centuries the general outline of the administration. After this, Mr. Norman Baines takes up the struggle with Persia under Constantius and Julian, and continues in a later chapter the story of the wars of Rome in East and West, 
in the times of valentinian and theodosius the victory of christianity is treated by principal lindsay and he describes also the rival systems of neoplatonism and mithraism and gives an account of julian's reaction and the last struggles of heathenism the next chapter is devoted to arianism first the doctrine is described in itself and in some of its relations to modern thought then the religious side of the nicene council is given and the complicated history of the reaction is traced down to the decisive overthrow of arianism and the empire of theodosius after this mr c h turner describes the organization of the church clergy creeds and worship looking back to the beginning but chiefly concerned with its development in the age of the great councils we now pass to the teutons dr martin bang begins in prehistoric times describing their migrations and their conquests westward and southward till the legions brought them to a stand on the rhine and the danube and their long struggle of four centuries to break through the roman frontier before the battle of hadrianople settled them inside the danube then dr mantius carries down the story through the administrations of theodosius and stilicho to the great collapse the passing of the rhine the overrunning of gaul and spain the roman mutiny of pavia and the sack of rome by alaric after this the great teutonic peoples have to be dealt with severally dr ludwig schmidt begins with the settlement of the visigoths in gaul traces the growth and culmination of their kingdom of toulouse and ends with their expulsion from aquitaine by clovis professor pfister gives the early history of the franks but they are still a feeble folk when he leaves them for the conquests of clovis belong to another volume then dr schmidt tells the little that is known of the Sueves and alans in spain and more fully describes the history and institutions of the vandal kingdom in africa to its destruction by belisarius our next chapter differs from the rest in containing very little history it is dr pisker's account of central asia and the altasian mountain nomads it is given as a general and much needed introduction to the chapters on the huns the avars the turks and the rest of the asiatic hordes who devastated europe in the middle ages to this is attached dr schmidt's short account of the huns and attila we next turn to our own country professor haverfield describes the conquest and organization of roman britain and the decline and fall of the roman power in the island while mr beck deals with the english in their continental home and tells the story of their settlement in britain from the english side after this mr barker records the last struggles of the western empire the loyalty of gaul and the disaffection of africa under aetius and majorian concluding with the barbarian mutiny at pavia which overthrew the last augustus of the west then m morris dumoulin continues the history of italy under the barbarian rule of odovacar and theodoric describing the great king's policy and showing how he kept in check for a while the feud of roman and barbarian which had wrecked the western empire turning now to the eastern provinces the fifth century which falls to mr brooks is upon the whole a prosaic period of second-rate rulers and dire financial strain yet even here we have striking events remarkable characters and important movements the fall of rufinus and the failure of gainus pulciera ruling the empire as a girl of sixteen the romance of athenais and the catastrophe of basiliscus the isaurian policy of leo and the reforms of anastasius then miss gardiner traces the history of religious disunion in the east the fall of chrysostom brought to the front the rivalry of constantinople and alexandria the defeat of nestorianism at aphis and of monophyticism at chalcedon fixed the lines of orthodoxy but left egypt and syria heterodox and disaffected and the reconciling henoticon of zeno produced nothing but a new schism in the next chapter dom butler traces the growth of monasticism and its various forms in east and west including the benedictine rule and the irish monks after this professor vinogradov surveys the whole field of social and economic conditions in the declining empire 
and shows the part which rotten economics and bad taxation played in its destruction then mr h f stewart gives his account of the heathen and christian literature of the time and of the various lines of thought which seemed to converge upon the grand figure of augustine the volume concludes with mr lethaby's account of the beginnings and early development of christian art shortly to the student of universal history the roman empire is the bulwark which for near six hundred years kept back the ever-threatening attacks of teutonic and altaian barbarism behind that bulwark rose the mighty structure of roman law and behind it a new order of the world was beginning to unfold from the fruitful seeds of christian thought so when the years of respite ended and the universal empire went down in universal ruin the christian church was able from the first to put some check on the northern conquerors and then by the long training of the middle ages to mould the nations of europe into forms which have issued in richer and fuller developments of life and civilization than imperial rome had ever known it remains for us to give our best thanks to dr a w ward for much counsel and assistance and to all those who have kindly helped us by looking over the proofs of particular chapters september nineteen eleven end of general preface and preface to volume one Section 1 of Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1. Section 1 by H. M. Guatkin. Chapter 1. Constantine and His City. The first question that has to be considered in laying down the plan of a medieval history is where to begin. Where shall we draw the line that separates it from ancient history? Some would fix it at the death of Domitian, others at that of Marcus. Some would come down to Constantine, to the death of Theodosius, to the great barbarian invasion of 406, or to the end of the Western Empire in 476 and others again would go on to gregory i or even as late as charlemagne there is even something to be said for beginning with augustus or at the destruction of jerusalem though perhaps these epochs are not seriously proposed however they all have their advantages if for example we consider only the literary merit of the historians we must draw the line after tacitus and if we fix our eyes on the feud of roman and barbarian we cannot stop till the coronation of charlemagne curiously enough the epoch usually laid down at the end of the western empire is four seventy six the epoch usually laid down at the end of the western empire in four seventy six is precisely the one for which there is least to be said we should do better than this by dividing in the middle of the gothic war five thirty five through five fifty three we have in quick succession the closing of the schools of athens the code of justinian and the great siege of rome and the abolition of the consulship the rome which belisarius delivered was still the rome of the caesars while the rome which narsus entered sixteen years later is already the rome of the popes it is the same in gaul the remains of the old civilization still found under the sons of clovis are mostly obliterated in the next generation procopius witnessed as great a revolution as did polybius but even this would not be satisfactory we cannot cut in two the gothic war and the reign of justinian in any case we can draw no sharp division after constantine without ignoring the greatest power of the world that eastern roman empire which carried down the old greco-roman civilization almost to the end of the middle ages in truth the precise beginning of medieval history is is as indefinite as the precise beginning of the fog there is no point between augustus and charlemagne where we can say the old is finished the new not yet begun choose where we will medieval elements are traceable before it ancient elements after it thus theodoric's government of italy is on the old lines while the frankish invasion of gaul belongs to the new order 
if in the present work we begin with constantine we do not mean that there is any break in history at this point though we see important changes in the adoption of christianity and the fixing of the government in the form it retained for centuries the chief advantage of choosing this epoch is that as the medieval elements were not strong before the fourth century we shall be able to trace nearly the whole of their growth without encroaching too much on ancient history at the same time we shall hold ourselves free to trace them back as far as may be needful and point out the ancient elements as late as they may appear we begin with an outline of constantine's life its significance we can discuss later flavius valerius constantinus was born at nasus in dacia about the year two seventy four his father constantius was already a man of some mark though still in the lower stages of the career which brought him to the purple on his father's side constantius belonged to the great families of dardania the hilly province north of macedonia while his mother was a niece of the emperor claudius gothicus but constantine's own mother helena was a woman of low rank from drepanum in bithynia though there is no reason to doubt that she held the legal and quite moral position of concubina or more genetic wife to constantius of constantine's early years we know only that he had no learned education and we may presume from his hesitating greek that he was brought up in latin lands perhaps partly in dalmatia where his father was at one time governor in two ninety three constantius was made caesar and practically master of gaul with the task assigned him of recovering britain from carusius but as a condition of his elevation he was required to divorce helena and marry theodora a stepdaughter of maximian constantine was taken to the court of diocletian partly as a hostage for his father and partly with a view to a future place for him in the college of emperors so he went with diocletian to egypt in two ninety six and made acquaintance on the way with eusebius the future bishop and bishop of caesarea next year he seems to have seen service with galerius against the persians about this time he must have taken menervina most likely as a concubina for her son crispus was already a young man in three seventeen early in three o three the great persecution was begun with the demolition of the church at nicomedia and there was a tall young officer looking on with thoughts of his own like napoleon watching the riot of june seventeen ninety two when diocletian and maximian abdicated one may three o five it was generally believed that constantine would be one of the new caesars there was reason for this belief he had been betrothed to fausta the daughter of maximian as far back as two ninety three when she was a mere child and daughters of emperors were not common enough to be thrown away on outsiders moreover money had recently been coined at alexandria with the inscription constantinus caesar but at the last moment diocletian passed him over perhaps he was over persuaded by galerius more likely he was reserving him to secede his father in gaul after this however the court of galerius was no place for constantine presently he managed to escape and join his father at boulogne after a short campaign in caledonia constantius died at york twenty five july three o six and the army hailed constantine augustus he was a good officer the sons of theodora were only boys and the army of britain always the most mutinous in the empire had no mind to wait for a new caesar from the east its chief mover was crocus the almanic king and this would seem to be the first case of a barbarian king as a roman general and also the first case of barbarian action in the election of an emperor willingly or unwillingly galerius recognized constantine though only as caesar it mattered little he had the power and the title came a couple of years later thus constantine succeeded his father in gaul and britain we hear little of his administration during the next six years three o six through three twelve but we get a general impression that he was a good ruler and careful of his people such fighting as he had to do was of the usual sort against the franks mostly inside the rhine 
and against the almani and the and the brukteri beyond it the war however was merciless for even heathen feeling was shocked when he gave barbarian kings to the beasts along with their followers by thousands at a time but gaul had never recovered from the great invasions 254 through 285 and his remissions of taxation gave no permanent relief to the public misery in religion he was of course heathen but he grew more and more monotheistic and the christians always counted him friendly like a father the last act of galerius april 311 was an edict of toleration for the christians it was not encumbered with any hard conditions but it was given on the heathen principle that every god is entitled to the worship of his own people whereas the persecution hindered the christians from rendering that worship footnote one of the toleration laws alluded to by licinius was so encumbered but this appears to have been the rescript of maximum daza a little later End of footnote. a few days after this galerius died there were now four emperors constantine held gaul and britain maxentius italy spain and africa while licinius more properly licinian ruled illyricum greece and thrace and maximum daza or daya held everything beyond the bosphorus their political alliances were partly determined by their geographical position constantine reaching over maxentius to licinius while maximin reached over licinius to maxentius partly also by their relation to the christians for this was now the immediate question of practical politics constantine was friendly to them and licinius had never been an active persecutor whereas maximine was a cruel and malicious enemy and maxentius standing as he did for rome could not but be hostile to them so maxentius was to crush constantine and maximin to deal with licinius constantine did not wait to be crushed breaking up his camp at colmar he pushed rapidly across the alps in a cavalry fight near turin the gauls overcame the formidable cataphracti horse and rider clad in mail of maxentius then straight to verona where in ruitius pompeianus he found a foeman worthy of his steel right well did pompeianus defend verona and if he escaped from the siege it was only to gather an army for its relief then another great battle pompeianus was killed verona surrendered and constantine made straight for rome still maxentius gave no sign he had baffled invasion twice before by sitting still in rome and constantine could not have besieged the city with far inferior forces at the last moment maxentius came out a few miles and offered battle twenty eighth october three twelve at saxa rubra a skilful flank march of constantine forced him to fight with the tiber behind him and the mulvian bridge for his retreat his numidians fled before the gaulish cavalry the praetorian guard fell fighting where it stood and the rest of the army was driven headlong into the river maxentius perished in the waters and constantine was master of the west this short campaign the most brilliant feat of arms since aurelian's time was an epic for constantine himself to it belongs the story of the shining cross somewhere between colmar and saxa rubra he saw in the sky one afternoon a bright cross with the words hoc vince and the army saw it too and in a dream that night christ bade him take it for his standard so constantine himself told eusebius and so eusebius recorded it in three thirty eight and there is no reason to suspect either the one or the other of deceit the evidence of the army is in any case not worth much but that of lactantius in three fourteen and of the heathen nasarius in three twenty one puts it beyond reasonable doubt that something of the sort did happen footnote lactantius is not discredited by the similar vision he gives to licinius why should not licinius take a hint from constantine and have a vision of his own End of footnote. but we need not therefore set it down for a miracle the cross observed may very well have been a halo such as whimper saw when he came down after the accident on the matterhorn in eighteen sixty five three crosses for his three lost companions 
the rest is no more than can be accounted for by constantine's imagination inflamed as it must have been by the intense anxiety of the unequal contest yet after all the cross was not an exclusively christian symbol the action was ambiguous like most of constantine's actions at this period of his life he was quite clear about monotheism but he was not equally clear about the difference between christ and the unconquered sun the gauls had fought of old beneath the sun god's cross of light so while the christians saw in the labarum the cross of christ the heathens in the army would only be receiving an old standard back again such was the origin of the byzantine labarum one enduring monument of the victory is the triumphal arch still standing at rome dedicated to him by the senate and people in three fifteen its inscription recites how instinctu divinitatis he inflicted just punishment on the tyrant and all his party the expression has been set down as a later correction of some heathen form as nutu iovus o m but it is certainly original and must express constantine's declared belief for we may trust the senate and the other panegyrists for knowing what was likely to please him constantine remained two months in rome leaving in the first days of three thirteen for milan where he gave his sister constantia in marriage to licinius and conferred with him on policy generally and on the hostile attitude of maximin in particular that ruler had not published the edict of galerius but merely sent a circular to the officials that actual persecution was to be stopped for the present a few months later about november three eleven he resumed it with less bloodshed and more statesmanship it was far more skilfully planned than any that had gone before maximin's endeavor was to stir up the municipalities against the christians to organize a rival church of heathenism and to give a definitely anti-christian bias to education even the fall of maxentius had drawn from him only a rescript so full of inconsistencies that neither heathens nor christians could make head or tail of it except that maximin was a prodigious liar he even denied that there had been any persecution during his reign at all events this was not the complete change of policy needed to save him constantine and licinius saw their advantage and issued from milan a new edict of toleration its text is lost but it went far beyond the edict of galerius for the first time in history the principle of universal toleration was officially laid down that every man has a right to choose his religion and to practice it in his own way without any discouragement from the state no doubt it was laid down as a political move for neither constantine nor licinius kept to it constantine tried to crush donatists and arians and licinius fell back even from toleration of christians still the old heathen principle that no man may worship gods who are not on the official list was rejected for the present and toleration became the general law of the empire till the time of theodosius the wedding festivities were rudely interrupted by the news that maximin had made a sudden attack without waiting for the end of the winter and met with brilliant success capturing byzantium and pushing on towards hadrianopoli there however licinius met him with a very inferior force and completely routed him thirty april three thirteen maximin fled to nicomedia and soon found that it would be as much as he could do to hold the line of mount taurus now he had no choice the christians were strong in egypt and syria and must be conciliated at any cost so he issued a new edict explaining that the officials had committed many oppressions very painful to a benevolent ruler like himself and now to make further mistakes impossible he lets all men know that every one is free to practise whatever religion he pleases maximin gives the same liberty as constantine and licinius he could not safely offer less but he states no principle of toleration however it was too late now maximin died in the summer and licinius issued a rescript carrying out the decisions of milan and restoring confiscated property to the corporation of the christians it was published at nicomedia thirteen june three thirteen constantine sent out similar letters in the west the defeat of maximin 
ends the long contest of church and state begun by nero former persecutions had died out of themselves and even gallienus had only restored the confiscated property but now the christians had gained full legal recognition of which they were never again deprived licinius and julian might devise annoyances and connive at outrages and work the administration in a hostile spirit but they never ventured to revoke the edict of milan heathenism was still strong in its associations with greek philosophy and culture with roman law and social order and its moral character stood higher than it had done it hardly looked like a beaten enemy yet such it was its last real hope was gone religious peace was assured but the unity of the empire was not yet restored constantine and licinius were both ambitious and war between them was only a question of time they were not unequally matched if constantine had the victorious legions of gaul licinius ruled the east from the frontier of armenia to that of italy so that he was master of the illyrian provinces which furnished the best soldiers of the roman army every emperor from claudius to licinius himself was an illyrian except tacitus and carus and if constantine had done a splendid feat of arms licinius was a fine soldier too and with all his personal vices not less careful of his subjects constantine was called away from milan by some incursions of the franks who kept him busy during the summer of three thirteen when things were more settled he proposed to institute a middle domain for his other brother-in-law bassianus the plan seems to have been that while constantine gave him italy licinius should give him illyricum licinius frustrated it by engaging bassianus in a plot for which he was put to death and then refused to give up to constantine his agent senesio the brother of bassianus this meant war constantine took the offensive as he had done before pushing into pannonia with no more than twenty thousand men and attacking licinius at Zebali, where he was endeavouring to cover sirmium he had thirty five thousand against him but a hard-fought battle eight october three fourteen ended in a complete victory and the capture of sirmium licinius fled towards adrianopoli deepening the quarrel on the way by giving the rank of caesar to his illyrian general valens a new army was collected but another great battle on the martian plain was indecisive constantine won the victory but licinius and valens were able to take up a threatening position in his rear at Beroea. so peace had to be made first valens was sacrificed then licinius gave up illyricum from the danube to the extremity of greece retaining in europe only thrace which however in those days reached north to the danube so things settled down constantine returned to rome in the summer to celebrate his decennalia twenty five july three fifteen and in three seventeen the succession was secured by the nominations of caesars crispus and constantine the sons of constantine and and licinianus the son of licinius crispus was grown up but constantine was a baby this treaty might be hollowed but it kept the peace for nearly eight years End of section 1section two of cambridge medieval history volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. cambridge medieval history volume one section two by h m guatkin the treaty might be hollow but it kept the peace for nearly eight years if constantine was evidently the stronger licinius was still too strong to be rashly attacked so each went his own way it soon appeared which was the better statesman constantine drew nearer to the christians while licinius drifted into persecution devising annoyances enough to make them enemies but not enough to make them harmless thus constantine allows manumission in churches judges the donatists closes the courts on sundays loads the churches with gifts and at last may three twenty three 
frees Christians from all pagan ceremonies of state. Licentius drove the Christians from his court, forbade meetings of bishops, and, and meddled vexatiously with their worship. This gave the war something of a religious character, but its occasion was not religious. The Goths had been pretty quiet since Aurelian had settled them in Dacia. It was not till 322 that Rasimod, their king, crossed the Danube on a foray. Constantine drove them back, chased them beyond the Danube, slew Razimod, and settled thousands of Gothic serfs in the adjacent provinces. But in the pursuit he crossed the territory of Licentius, and this led to war. Constantine's army was 130,000 men strong, and his son Crispus had a fleet of 200 sail in the Piraeus. Licinius awaited him with 160,000 men near Hadrianopoli, while his admiral, Amandus, was to hold the Hellespont with 350 ships. There was no idea of using the fleet to take Constantine in the rear. After some difficult maneuvers, Constantine won the first battle, 3 July 323, but was brought to a stop before the walls of Byzantium. Licinius was safe there so long as he held the sea, so he chose Martinianus, his magister officiorum, for the new Augustus of the West, Meanwhile, Constantine strengthened his fleet, and his son Crispus completely defeated Amandus in the Hellespont. Licinius left Byzantium to defend itself. It had held out two years against Severus, and prepared to maintain the Asiatic shore. Constantine left Byzantium on one side and landed near Chrysopolis, where he found the whole army of Licinius drawn up to meet him. The Battle of Chrysopolis, 18 or 20 September 323, was decisive. Licinius fled to Nicomedia, and presently Constantia came out to ask for her husband's life. It was granted, and Constantine confirmed his promise with an oath. Nevertheless, Licentius was put to death in October 325 on a charge of treasonable intrigue. The charge is unlikely, but Licinius was quite capable of it, and his execution does not seem to have estranged Constantia from her brother, but perhaps the matter is best connected with the family tragedy, which we shall come to presently. As a general, Constantine ranks high among the emperors. Good soldiers, as they mostly were, none but Severus and Aurelian could boast of any such career of victory as had brought Constantine from the shores of Britain to the banks of the Tiber and the walls of Byzantium but after the crowning mercy of Chrysopolis, there was no more fighting except with the Goths. The last fourteen years of Constantine, 323 through 337, were years of peace, and the first question which then confronted him was the question of religion. By what road did he approach Christianity, and how far did he come on the journey? Two fables may be dismissed at once. The heathen fable told by Zosimus in the 5th century, that Christians were complacent when the philosophers refused to absolve him for the murder of his son Crispus, and the papal fable of the 8th century, that he was healed of leprosy by Pope Sylvester, and thereupon gave him dominion over the palace, the city of Rome, and the entire West. These legends are summarily refuted by the fact that he was baptized in 337, not as they tell us in 326. Turning now to history, we have no reason to suppose that he owed Christian impressions to his mother's teaching. But Constantius was an eclectic of the better sort, and a man of some culture, and his memory contrasted well with that of his colleagues. Constantine seems to have begun where his father left off, as more or less monotheistic and averse to idols, and more or less friendly to the Christians, and all these things grew upon him. The last of them may not have meant much at first, but even hostile emperors like Severus and Diocletian had sense enough to keep on good terms with the Christians when they were not prepared to crush them. But Constantine was drawn to them personally, as well as politically. By his pure life and genuine humanity, as well as by his shrewd statesmanship. Their lofty monotheism and austere morals attracted the man. Their strong organization arrested the attention of the ruler. When Diocletian threw down his challenge to the church, 
he made religion the urgent question of the time and the persecution was a visible failure before constantine was well settled in gaul if diocletian had failed to crush the church others were not likely to secede maximin or licinius might hearken back to the past but constantine saw clearly that the empire would have to make some sort of terms with the church so that the only question was how far it would be needful or safe to go for the moment a little friendliness to the gaulish bishops was enough to secure the goodwill of the christians all over the empire then came the wars of three twelve through three thirteen which forced on constantine and licinius the championship of the christians and made it plain good policy to give them full legal toleration licinius stopped there and constantine did not make up his mind without anxiety the god of the christians had shown great power and might be the best protector and in any case a firm alliance with their strong hierarchy would not only remove a great danger but give the very help which the empire needed on the other hand it was a serious thing to break with the past and brave the terrors of heathen magic moreover the christians were a minority even in the east and he could not openly go over to them without risk of a pagan reaction so he moved cautiously christianity differed forsooth very little from the better sort of heathenism they could both be brought under the broad shield of monotheism if the heathens would give up their idols and immoral worships and the christians would not insist too rudely on that awkward doctrine of the deity of christ on these terms the lion of christianity might lie down with the lamb of eclecticism and the guileless emperor would be the little child to lead them both the problem of church and state was new for the old religion of rome was never more than a department of the state and the worshippers of isis and mithras readily conformed to the ceremonies of the roman people but when christianity made a practical distinction between caesar's things and god's the relation of church and state became a difficult question constantine handled it with great skill and much success he not only made the christians thoroughly loyal but won the active support of the churches and obtained such influence over the bishops that they seemed almost willing to sink into a department of the state but he forgot one thing the surface thought of his time christian as well as heathen tended to a vague monotheism which looked on christ and the son as almost equally good symbols of the supreme and this obscured the deeper conviction of the christians that the deity of christ is as essential as the unity of god after all christianity is not a monotheistic philosophy but a life in christ when this conviction asserted itself with overwhelming power at the council of nicaea constantine gave way with a good grace as it had been decided at saxa rubra that the empire was to fight beneath the cross of god so now it was decided at nicaea that the cross was to be the cross of christ and not the sun god's cross of light we may doubt whether constantine took in the full meaning of the decision but at any rate it meant that the christians refused to be included with others in a monotheistic state religion if the empire was to have their full friendship it must become definitely christian and this is the goal to which constantine seems to have looked forward in his later years though he can hardly have hoped himself to reach it heathenism was still strong and he continued to use vague monotheistic language only in his last illness did he feel it safe to throw off the mask and avow himself a christian let there be no ambiguity said he as he asked for baptism and then he laid aside the purple and passed away in the white robe of a christian neophyte twenty two may three thirty seven this would seem to be the general outline of constantine's religious life and policy we can now return to the morrow of chrysopolis and take it in more detail now that he was master of the empire he made his alliance with the christians as close as he could without abandoning the official neutrality of his monotheism his attitude is well shown by his coins mars and genius p r disappear after saxa rubra or at latest by three seventeen 
so invictus by three fifteen or at any rate three twenty three coins of jupiter augustus seem to have been struck only for licentius later on the heathen inscriptions are replaced by phrases as neutral as the cross itself like beata tranquillitas or providentia augustus or instinctu divinitas on his on his triumphal arch at rome his laws kept pace with the coins in form they are mostly neutral but they show an increasing leaning to christianity thus his edict for the observance of the venerable day of the sun only raised it to the rank of the heathen ferrier by closing the law courts and the latin prayer he imposed on the army the first case known of prayer in an unknown tongue is quite indeterminate as between christ and jupiter so too when before three sixteen he sanctioned manumissions in churches it was only taking a hint from the manumissions in certain temples yet again when in three thirteen and by later law he exempted the clergy of the catholic church not those of the sects from the decorian and other burdens he gave them only the privileges already enjoyed by some of the heathen priests and teachers but the relief was great enough to cause an ungodly rush for holy orders and with it such a loss of taxpayers that in three twenty he had to forbid the ordination of any one qualified for the curia of his city none but the poor and an occasional official could now be ordained and those only to fill vacancies caused by death the second limitation may not have been enforced but the first remained to save the revenue the church was debased at a stroke other laws however lean more to a side like the edict of three nineteen which threatens to burn the jews if they stone a convert to the worship of god no doubt such converts needed protection and roman law was not squeamish about burning criminals if they were of low rank upon the whole this policy of official neutrality and personal favor powerfully stimulated the growth of the churches the time servers were all christian now and eusebius plainly denounces their unspeakable hypocrisy at least in later years constantine himself had to rebuke bishops for flattery the defeat of licinius enabled him to come forward more openly as the patron of the churches his letter to the provincials of the empire eusebius naturally gives the copy which went to palestine begins with high praise of the confessors and strong denunciation of the persecutors whose wickedness is shown by their miserable ends they would have destroyed the republic if the divinity had not raised up me constantine from the war west of britain to destroy them he then restores rank and property to all the victims of persecution in the islands the mines and the houses of forced labor and finishes with an earnest exhortation to the worship of the one true god but after all the church was not quite what constantine wanted it to be he was not more attached to it by its lofty monotheism than by the imposing unity which promised new life to the weary state for six hundred years the world had been in quest of a universal religion stoicism was no more than a philosophy for the few the worship of the emperor was debased by officialism and by this time quite outworn and even mithraism had never shown such living power as christianity here then was something that could realize the religious side of the empire in a nobler form than augustus or hadrian had ever dreamed of a universal church that could stand beside the universal empire and worthily support its labors for the peace and welfare of the world but for this purpose unity was essential if the church was divided against itself it could not help the empire worse than this it could hardly be divided against itself without being also divided against the empire one of the parties was likely to appeal to the emperor and then he would have to decide between them and make an enemy of the defeated party and if he tried to enforce his decision they were likely to resist him as stubbornly as the whole church had resisted the heathen emperors this would bring back the whole difficulty of the persecutions though possibly on a smaller scale to put it shortly the christians had a conscience in matters of religion and sometimes mistook self-will for conscience constantine had experience of christian self-will in africa 
soon after the defeat of Maxentius, when Diocletian commanded the Christians to give up their sacred books, all parties agreed in refusing to obey. Those who did obey were called traditores, but the officers did not always care what books they took. Might apocryphal books be given up? So thought Mansurius of Carthage, while others counted it apostasy to give up any books at all. The controversy became acute at the death of Mansurius in 311, when Felix of Aptunga consecrated his successor, but that right was claimed by Secundus of Tigesus, the senior bishop of Numidia, who consecrated a rival bishop of Carthage. It was some time before the Donatists, as they soon came to be called, got their position clear. They held that Felix was a traditor, that the ministrations of a traditor are null and void, and that a church which has communion with a traditor is apostate. After the Battle of Sax Rubra, Constantine sent money to Cecilian for the clergy of the Catholic Church, and as he had heard that some evil-disposed persons were troubling them, he directed Cecilian to refer them to the civil authorities for punishment. Thereupon they appealed to him. Constantine seems to have contemplated a small court to try the case. Miliades of Rome, three Gaulish bishops, and apparently the archdeacon of Rome, but a small council met instead, October 313, at Rome, which pronounced for Cecilian. The Donatists were furious and appealed again. This time Constantine summoned as many bishops as he could, directing each to bring so many clergy and servants with him, and giving him power to use the state post, cursus publicus, for the journey. So a large council of the Western churches met at Arles in August 314, possibly 315. Even Britain sent bishops from London, York, and some other place. It destroyed the Donatist contention by deciding that Felix was not a triator. It also settled some more outstanding controversies in favor of the Roman date of Easter and the Roman custom of not repeating heretical baptism if it had been given in the name of the Trinity. The decisions were sent to Sylvester of Rome for circulation, not for confirmation. We can recognize in Arles the pattern of the Nicene Council, Still the Donatists were not satisfied. They asked the emperor to decide the matter himself, and he unwillingly consented. He heard them at Milan, November 316, and once more decided against them. Then they turned round and said, What business has the emperor to meddle with the church? A vigorous prosecution was begun, but with small success. A band of Donatist fanatics called Circumcelliones ranged the country, committing disorders and defying the authorities to make martyrs of them. Even in 317, Constantine ordered that their outrages were not to be retaliated, and when they sent him a message in 321 that they would in no way communicate with that scoundrel, his bishop, he stopped the persecution as useless, and frankly gave them toleration. Africa was fairly quiet for the rest of his reign. After the defeat of Licinius, Constantine found several disputes in the eastern churches. The old Easter question was still unsettled. The Miletian schism was dividing Egypt, and there was no knowing how far the Arian controversy would spread. Unity must be restored at once, and that by the old plan of calling a council. The churches had long been in the habit of conferring together when difficulties arose they could refuse to recognize an unsatisfactory bishop, and circa 369 a council ventured to depose Paul of Samisata, and Aurelian had enforced its decision. The weak point of this method was that rival councils could be got up, so that every local quarrel had an excellent chance of becoming a general controversy. Arianism in particular was setting council against council, Constantine determined to go a step beyond these local meetings, as he had summoned the western bishops to Arles, so now he summoned all the bishops of Christendom. If he could bring them to a decision, it was not likely to be disputed, and in any case he could safely give it the force of law. An ecumenical council would be a grand demonstration, not only of the unity of the church, but of its close alliance with the empire. 
so he issued invitations to all christian bishops to meet him at nicaea in bithynia in the summer of three twenty five to make a final end of all the disputes which rent the unity of christendom the program was even wider than at arles but the donatists were not included in it constantine could let sleeping dogs lie we note here the choice of nicaea for its auspicious name the city of victory and convenience of access and we see in it one of the many signs that the true centre of the empire was settling down somewhere near the bosphorus we need not closely analyze the imposing list of bishops present from almost every province of the empire with a few from beyond its frontiers in the far east and north legend made them three hundred and eighteen the holy number of the cross of jesus we have lists in sundry languages none of them giving more than two hundred and twenty one names but these are known to be incomplete the actual number may have been near three hundred all the thirteen great dioceses of the empire were represented except britain and illyricum though only single bishops came from africa spain gaul and dacia only one came in person from italy though two presbyters appeared for the bishop of rome so the vast majority came from the eastern provinces of the empire the outsiders were four or five theopolis bishop of the goths beyond the danube Catherius, the name is corrupt of the crimean bosphorus john the persian and ristasis the armenian the son of gregory the illuminator with perhaps another armenian bishop eusebius is full of enthusiasm over his majestic role of churches far and near from the extremity of europe to the furthest ends of asia it was a day of victory for both the empire and the church the empire had not only made peace with the stubbornness of its enemies but been accepted as its protector and guide the church had won the greatest of all its victories when galerius issued his edict of toleration but its mission to the whole world had never been so vividly embodied as by that august assembly we miss half the meaning of the council if we overlook the tremulous hope and joy of those first years of world-wide victory athanasius shows it even more than eusebius one thing at least is clear the new world faced the old and the spell of the holy roman empire had already begun to work constantine took up at once the position of a moderator he began by burning unread the budget of complaints against each other which the bishops had presented to him he then preached them a sermon on unity and unity was his text all through he was much more anxious to make the decisions unanimous than to influence them one way or another his one object was to make an end of division in the churches so whatever pleased the bishops pleased the emperor too easter was fixed according to the custom of rome and alexandria for the sunday after the full moon following the vernal equinox it is the role we have now and though it did not produce complete unity till the lunar cycle was quite settled it secured that easter should come after the passover for said constantine how can we who are christians keep the same day as those ungodly jews the Miletian schism was peacefully settled to the disgust of anathasius in later years by giving the Miletian clergy a status next to the orthodox with a right of secession if found worthy so far well but the condemnation of arianism may have been something of a trial to constantine who could not quite see why they thought it worth while to be so hot on such a trifling question as the deity of christ however that may be arianism was politically impossible he must have known already from hosius that the west would not accept it and the first act of the council meant its most unanimous rejection by the east as soon as there was no doubt what the decision would be he did his best to make it quite unanimous all the arts of imperial persuasion were tried on the waverers till in the end only two stubborn recusants remained to be sent into exile to some wider aspects of the council we shall return hereafter for the moment it may be enough to say that constantine had won a great success he had not only got his questions settled but had himself taken a conspicuous part in settling them more than this he had established formal relations no longer with bishops or groups of bishops 
but with a great confederacy of churches the churches had long been tending to organize themselves on the lines of the empire as we see in cyprian's theories and now constantine made the church an alter ego of the state and gave it a concrete unity of the political sort which it never had before henceforth the holy catholic church of the creeds was more and more limited to the confederation of churches recognized by the state so that it only remained to compel all men to come into these and prevent the formation of any other religious communities in this way the church became much more useful to the state and also perhaps fitter to resist the shock of the barbarian conquest which followed but surely something was lost in freedom and spirituality and therefore also in practical morality we pass from the council of nicaea to a family tragedy so far constantine may pass as fairly merciful to the plotters of his own house maximian bassanius and licentius had all tried to assassinate him and if he put to death bassianus see page eight he had spared maximian till he plotted again and so far he had spared licentius also but now in a few months from october three twenty five he puts to death not only licentius but his own son crispus and the younger licentius then his own wife fausta and then a number of his friends the facts are certain but their exact meaning is obscure it must however be noticed that the dynastic policy of diocletian had given a new political importance to members of an imperial family the widows of the third century emperors fall into obscurity but the widow of galerius is first sought in marriage by maximin Deza, then executed by licinius who also put to death the children of severus Deza and galerius now constantine married twice and there may well have been a bitter division in his family minervina was the mother of crispus whom we have seen greatly distinguishing himself in the war with licinius and there seems no serious doubt that the three younger sons were children of faustus though the eldest of them was not born till three fifteen or three sixteen eight years after her marriage so we come to the questions we cannot answer was constantine jealous of his eldest son or anxious to get him out of the way of the others or was crispus a plotter justly put to death and how came fausta to share his fate a little later they are not likely to have been accomplices in a plot or connected by a guilty passion though the story of sosimus is not impossible that she accused him falsely and was herself put to death for it when helena convicted her we have not material enough for any decided opinion the worst point it may be against constantine is that he did not spare the young licentius he was the son of constantia he cannot have been more than twelve years old but the allusions to him suggest that he was something more than a boy and we know that constantia was on the best of terms with her brother when she died a couple of years later if constantine suspected the elder licentius the new sultanism would involve the younger in his fate and if crispus had married helena his daughter suspicion might attach to him too faustus fate is the mystery or was constantine more or less out of his mind that winter as despots occasionally are one or two of his laws may point that way and the possibility may help to explain a good deal End of section two. section three of cambridge medieval history volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1, Section 3 Constantine and His City by H. M. Guatkin. Constantine kept his Vincenalia at Rome in the summer of 326. It was an unhappy visit, even if the domestic tragedy had already taken place. Rome was the focus of heathenism and of Roman pride she expected to see her sovereigns at the ceremonies and to treat them with something of republican familiarity constantine scandalized her with his eastern pomp and gave deep offence to the senate and people by refusing to join the immemorial procession of the knights of rome to the capital when he left the city in september he left it forever rome indeed had long ceased to be a good capital 
is too far from the frontier for military purposes too full of republican survivals for such sultans as the emperor had now become too heathen for christian caesars so maximian held his court at milan while diocletian gradually shifted his chief resort eastward from sirmium to nicomedia there were many signs now that the seat of empire ought to be somewhere near the bosphorus the chief dangers had always come from the danube and the euphrates and about the Bosphorus was the only point which commanded both. If these were watched by the emperor himself, the Rhine might be left in charge of a Caesar. This was much the better course for the present. But in the long run the problem was insoluble. The Rhine and the Danube might be guarded, or the Danube and the Euphrates, but now that Rome had failed to make a solid nation of her empire, she could not permanently guard all three together. Sooner or later it must come to a choice between the Rhine and the Euphrates, between Italy and Greece, between Europe and Asia. Constantine is not likely to have seen clearly all this, but he did see that he commanded more important countries from the Bosphorus than he could from Rome or Milan. These might control the Latin West and the Upper Danube, but at the Bosphorus he had at his feet the Greek world from Taurus to the Balkans, flanked northward by the warlike peoples of Illyricum, and eastward by the great barbarian fringe of Egypt, Syria, and Armenia, reaching from the Caucasus to the cataracts of the Nile. Nobody could yet foresee that by the seventh century nothing but the Greek world would be left. But where precisely was the new capital to be placed? Nicomedia would have been Diocletian's city, not Constantine's, and in any case it lay at the far end of a gulf, some fifty miles from the main line of traffic. Constantine may at one time have dreamed of his own birthplace, Nisus, or of Sardica, and at another he began buildings on the site of Troy, before he fixed upon the matchless position of Byzantium. Europe and Asia are separated by the broad expanses of the Euxine and Aegean seas, together stretching nearly a thousand miles from the Crimea to the mountains of Crete, and in ancient times almost fringed round with Greek cities. It is not at all a land of the vine and the olive, even in Aegean waters, for the Russian wind sweeps over the whole region, except in sheltered parts, as where Trezibon is protected by the Caucasus, Philippe by the Rodope, or Sparta by Tegetus, or where Ionia hides behind the Mysian Olympus and the Trojan Ida. For all its heat in summer, Constantinople is quite as cold in winter as London, and the western points of the Black Sea are more cumbered with ice than the north of Norway. But the Aegean and the Euxian are not a single broad sheet of water. In the narrows between them the coasts of Europe and Asia draw so close together that we can sail for more than two hundred miles in full view of both continents. Leaving the warm south behind at Lesbos, Mytilene, we pass from the Aegean to the Propontis, Marmara, by the Hellespont, Dardanelles, a channel of some fifty miles in length to Gallipoli, and two or three miles broad, then a voyage of a hundred and forty miles through the more open waters of the Propontis brings us to the Bosphorus, which averages only three-quarters of a mile wide, and has a winding course of sixteen miles from Byzantium to the Cyanean rocks at the entrance of the Euxine. It follows that a city on the Propontis is protected north and south by the narrow passages of the Bosphorus and the Dardanelles and that all traffic between the Aegean and the Euxine must pass its walls. Moreover, the Bosphorus lay more conveniently than the Dardanelles for the passage from Europe to Asia. Thus two of the chief trade routes of the Roman world crossed each other at Byzantium. The Megarians may have had some idea of these things when they colonized Chalcedon, B.C. 674, just outside the south end of the Bosphorus on the Asiatic side of the Propontis, but the site of Chalcedon has no special advantages, so that its founders became a proverb of blindness for overlooking the superb position of Byzantium across the water, which was not occupied till B.C. 657. At the south end of the Bosphorus, on the European side, a blunt triangle is formed by the Propontis and the Golden Horn, a deep inlet of the Bosphorus running seven miles to the northwest. On the rising ground between them was built the city of Byzantium, Small as its extent was in Greek times, it played a great part in history. Its command of the corn trade of the Euxine made it one of the most important strategic positions in the Greek world, 
so that its capture by alexander it had repulsed philip was one of the chief steps of his advanced empire it formed an early alliance with the romans who freed it from its perpetual trouble with the barbarians of thrace whom neither peace nor war could keep quiet vespasian a d seventy three took away its privileges and threw it into the province of thrace in the civil wars of septimius severus it took the side of Pisinius Niger and held out for two years after Niger's overthrow at Issus in 194. Severus destroyed its walls and made it a subject village of Perenthus. Caracalla made it a city again, but it was sacked afresh by Gallienus. Meanwhile, the Gothic Vikings came sailing past its ruined walls to spread terror all over the Aegean and to the shores of Italy. Under the Illyrian emperors, it was fortified again. Even then it was taken first by Maximum Daza, and then by Constantine in the First Licinian War, so that its full significance only came out in the second. Licinius was a good general, and pivoted the whole war upon it after his defeat at Hadraniopal. He might have held his ground indefinitely if the destruction of his fleet in the Hellespont had not driven him from Byzantium. The lesson was not lost on Constantine. He began the work some time after his visit to Rome, and pushed it forward with impatience. He traced his walls to form a base two and a half miles from the apex of the triangle. Byzantium stood on a single hill, but it took in five, and his successors counted seven, according to the number of hills of Rome. The marketplace was on the second hill, where his camp had been during the siege. He erected great buildings and gathered works of art from all parts to adorn it. The temples of Byzantium remained, though they were overshadowed by the great cathedral of the Twelve Apostles. Some heathen ceremonies also were used, for Constantinople was the last and greatest colony of Rome, and for centuries retained the flavor of a Latin city. He gave it a senate also, and brought over many of the senators of Rome to be senators of the new Rome, for such was its official title, though it has always been known as the city of Constantine. The Northmen called it simply Miklagard, the great city. It never had much in the way of amphitheater or beast fights. Amusement more Christian and humane were provided by a circus and horse races. Its corn largesses were like those of Rome, and the corn of Egypt was diverted to its use, leaving that of Sicily and Africa for Rome. The new Rome stood next to the old in rank and dignity, being separated from the province of Europa and governed by proconsuls till it received a prefectus urbi, like Rome in 359. The bishop also soon shook off his dependence on Perinthus, and was recognized as standing next to the bishop of Rome, because Constantinople is new Rome, by the council of 381. This ousted Alexandria from the second place, and the jealousy thereupon arising had important ecclesiastical consequences. The work was complete, so far as the hasty building would allow, by the spring of 330, and 11 May of that year is the official date for the foundation of Constantinople. It would be hard to overestimate the strength given to the empire by the new capital. So long as the Romans held the sea, the city was impregnable. If it was attacked on one side, it could draw supplies from the other, and when it was attacked on both sides in 628, Persians and Avars could not join hands across the Bosphorus. Even when the command of the sea was lost, it still remained a fortress of uncommon strength. So stood Constantinople for more than a thousand years. Goths and Avars, Persians and Saracens, Bulgarians and Russians, dashed in vain upon its walls, and even the Turks failed more than once. It was often enough taken in civil war by help from within, but no foreign enemy ever stormed its walls till the Fourth Crusade, A.D. 1204. The Arian controversy first made it clear that the heart of the empire was in the Greek world, or more precisely in Asiatic Greece between the Taurus and the Bosphorus, and of the Greek world, Constantinople was the natural capital. It did not, however, at once become the regular residence of the emperors. Constantine himself died in a suburb of Nicomedia. Constantius led a wandering life. Jovian never reached the city and Valens in his later years avoided it. Theodosius was the first emperor who made it his usual residence, but the commercial supremacy of Constantinople was assured from the outset. 
the centre of gravity of asia minor had shifted northward since the first century and the bosphorus gave an easier passage to europe than the aegean so the roads which had converged on ephesus now converged on constantinople it dominated the greek world and the greek world was the solid part of the empire which resisted all attacks for ages the loss was more apparent than real when first the slavic lands were torn away then syria and egypt and lastly sicily and italy the empire was never struck in any vital part till the seljuks rooted out greek civilization from the highland of asia minor in the eleventh century even after that it was still a conquering power under the Comnenians and the house of lascaris and its fate was never hopeless till its last firm ground in asia was destroyed by the corrupt and selfish policy of michael palaeologus we know little of constantine's declining years except that they were generally years of peace the civil wars were ended at chrysopolis now there was not even a pretender unless we count as such caloceras the camel driver in cyprus who was put down without much difficulty and duly burned in the marketplace of tarsus three thirty five if the rhine was not entirely quiet the troubles there were not serious the jews to be sure were never loyal and the christian empire had already shown marked hostility to them a rising mentioned only by chrysostom is most likely a legend but there may have been already some signs of the great outbreak put down by ursienus in three fifty two however upon the whole there was peace the old emperor never again took the field in person his last war was with the goths and that was conducted by the younger constantine on a broad view the legions of the danube faced the germans in its upper course and the goths lower down with the sarmatians between them in each of these names stand for sundry tribes and groups of tribes whose mutual enmities were diligently fostered by the policy of rome in three thirty one the sarmatians and the vandals had somehow got mixed up together and suffered a great defeat from the goths they asked constantine for help and he was very willing to check the growth of the gothic power araric the gothic king replied by carrying the war into the roman province of moesia from which he was driven out with heavy loss the younger constantine gained a great victory over him twenty april three thirty two and when peace was made the goths returned to their old position as servants and allies of rome but when the sarmatians themselves made inroads on roman territory constantine left them to their fate they were soon in difficulties with Geberic, the new Gothic king, and with their own slaves, the Limangantes, who drove them out of their country. Some fled to the Quati, some found refuge among the Gothic tribes, but three hundred thousand of them sought shelter in the empire and were given lands by Constantine, chiefly in Pannonia. The most interesting circumstance of the Gothic war is the help which Constantine received from Cherson, the last of the Greek republics it stood where Sebastopol now stands. The story is told only by Constantine poor Phyrogeniatus, 9.11 through 9.59, but the learned emperor was an excellent antiquarian and used original authorities. Cherson and the Goths were old enemies, Rome and Cherson old allies. The Republic decided for war, and its first magistrate, Diogenes, struck a decisive blow by attacking the rear of the Goths cherson received a rich reward from constantine and remained in generally friendly relations to the empire till its annexation in eight twenty nine and even till its capture by the russians in nine eighty eight the settlement of the danube was the last of constantine's great services to the empire the edict of milan had removed the standing danger of christian disaffection in the east the defeat of licinius had put an end to the civil wars the reform of the administration completed Diocletian's work of reducing the army to permanent obedience. The Council of Nicaea had secured the active alliance of the Christian churches. The foundation of Constantinople made the seat of power safe for centuries, and now the consolidation of the northern frontier seemed to enlist all the most dangerous enemies of Rome in her defense. The empire gained 300,000 settlers for the waste of the Gothic march, and a firm peace of more than thirty years with the greatest of the northern nations henceforth the rhine was guarded by the franks the danube covered by the goths and the euphrates flanked by the christian kingdom of armenia 
The empire was already dangerously dependent on barbarian help inside and outside its frontiers, but the Roman peace never seemed more secure than when the skillful policy of Constantine had formed its chief barbarian enemies into a covering ring of friendly client states. At all events, the years of peace were not a time of healthful recovery. The empire had not gained strength in the long peace of the Antonines, and it had gone a long way downhill since the second century. When Diocletian came to the throne in 284, he found three great problems before him. The first was military, how to stop the continual mutinies which cut off the emperors before they could do their work. This he solved, though at the cost of leaving behind him a period of civil war. The second was religious, how to deal with the Christians. Diocletian was wrong on this, and left his mistake to be repaired by Constantine. The third and hardest was mainly economic, to restore the dwindled agriculture, commerce, and population of the empire. On this Diocletian and Constantine went wrong together. They not only failed to cure the evil, but greatly increased it. Not much was gained by remitting taxes that could not be paid, and settling barbarian colonists and barbarian serfs in the wasted provinces. Serious economic difficulties have moral causes, and there was no radical cure short of a complete change in the temper of society. Yet much might have been done by a permanent reduction of taxation, and a reform of its incidents and of the methods of collection. Instead of this, the machinery of government, and its expense, was greatly increased. The army had to be held in check by courts of oriental splendor in a vast establishment of corrupt officials. We can see the growth of officialism even in the language. If we compare the Latin words in Athanasius with those in the New Testament, so heavier taxes had to be levied from a smaller and poorer population. Taxation under the empire had never been light. In the third century it grew heavy. Under Diocletian it was crushing, and in the later years of Constantine the burden was further increased by the enormous expenditure which built up the new capital, like the city in a fairy tale. We are within sight of the time when the whole policy of the government was dictated by dire financial need. We have already reached a state of things like that we see in Russia. The strongest of the emperors had never been able to put down brigandage, and now disorder was rampant in the mountains, and often elsewhere. The great army of officials was all-powerful for oppression, and very little controlled by the emperor. He might displace an official at a moment's notice, or deliver him to the avenging flames, but he could enforce no reform against the passive resistance of the officials and the landowners so things drifted on from bad to worse. Nor can we doubt that Constantine himself grew slacker in the years of peace. Nature had richly gifted him with sound health, strong limbs, and a stately presence. His energy was untiring, his observation keen, his decision quick. He was a splendid soldier and the best general since Aurelian. If he had no learned education, he was not without interest in literature, and in practical statesmanship he may fairly rank with Diocletian. His general humanity stands out clear in his laws, for no emperor ever did more for the slave, the foundling, and the oppressed. If he began by giving the Frankish kings to the beast, he went on, 325, to forbid the games of the amphitheater. In private life he was chaste and sober, moderate and pleasant, yet he was given to raillery, and his nearest friends could not entirely trust him. His ambition was great, and he was very susceptible to flattery. So freely was it ministered to him that he sometimes had to check it himself, but in his later years he was more or less influenced by unworthy favorites, as Ablabius and Sopater seem to have been. No doubt his Christianity is of itself an offense to Zosimus and Julian, so that we may discount their charges of sloth and luxury, but on the whole the judgment of Eutropius would seem impartial, that Constantine was a match for the best emperors in the early part of his reign, and at its end no more than average. As Constantine had won the empire, so now he had to dispose of it. Constantine, Constantius, and Constans, his three sons by Fausta, were born in 316, 317, 320, and received the title of Caesar in 317, 323, and 333. In 335 their inheritance was marked out. Constantine was to have the Gaulish prefecture, Constantius the Eastern, Constans the Italian, and Illyrian. This is the partition actually made after the emperor's death. 
but for the present it was complicated by some obscure transactions. Constantine had made honorable provision for his half-brothers, Delmatius and Julius Constantius, the sons of Theodora, and they never gave him political trouble. Of their sisters he married Constantia to Licinius, Anastasia to Bosinius, and Nepotianus, of whom the second certainly was a great Roman noble, so that they too suffered no disparagement. Bosselina also, the wife of Julius Constantius and mother of the emperor Julian, belonged to the great Anasian family. Now Delmatius left two sons, Delmatius and Hannibalianus. Of these Delmatius must have been a man of mark, for he held the high office of Magister Militum, and was made Caesar in 335, while Hannibalianus was the husband of Constantine's daughter Constantia but they had no proper claim to any share in the secession, and we do not know why they were given it. There may have been parties in the palace, and if so, Ablabius was likely to have had a share in the matter, for he was put to death along with them in the massacre which followed Constantine's death. Certain it is that shares were carved out for them from the inheritance of their cousins. Delmatius was to have the Gothic march, while Hannibalianus received Pontus, with the astonishing title of Rex Regum, for no Roman since the Tarquins had ever borne the name of king. The strange title may point to some design upon Armenia, for the whole eastern question of the day was raised when Persia threatened war. Four emperors in the third century had met with disaster on the Persian frontier, but there had been forty years of peace since the victory of Galerius in 297. The empire gained Mesopotamia to the Aboras, and the five provinces which covered the southern slopes of the Armenian mountains, and in Armenia itself Roman supremacy was fully recognized by its great king Tiridates, 287-314. If his adoption of Christianity led to a short war with Maximin Daza, it only drew Armenia closer to Constantine. But if the royal house was Christian, and leaned on Rome, there was a large heathen party which looked to Persia, and Persian was an aggressive power under Sabor II, 309 through 380. A vigorous persecution of Christians was carried on, and war with Rome was only a question of time. Sapor demanded back the five provinces and attacked Mesopotamia, while a revolution in the palace threw Armenia into his hands. How much of this was done during Constantine's lifetime is more than we can say, but at all events a Persian war was plain in sight by the spring of 337, and a war with Persia was too serious a matter to be left to Caesar's like a Frankish foray or a Gothic inroad, so the old emperor prepared to take the field in person. He never set out. Constantine fell sick soon after Easter, and when the sickness grew upon him, he took up his abode at Ancyrona, a suburb of Nicomedia, as his end drew near, he received the imposition of hands, for up to that time he had not been even a catechumen. He then applied for baptism, explaining that he had hoped some day to receive it in the waters of the Jordan, like the Lord himself. After the ceremony, he laid aside the purple and passed away in stainless white, 22 May 337. As all his sons were absent, the government was carried on for three months in the dead emperor's name, till they had made their arrangements and the soldiers had slaughtered almost the entire house of Theodora. Constantine was buried on the spot he himself marked out in the cathedral of the Twelve Apostles, in his own imperial city. The Greek church still calls him his apostolos, an equal of the apostles. End of section 3section four of cambridge medieval history volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by lewis heman louisville kentucky cambridge medieval history volume one section four the reorganization of the empire by j s reed Chapter 2. The Reorganization of the Empire It is natural to think of Diocletian as the projector, and of Constantine as the completer, 
of a new system of government for the Roman Empire, which persisted with mere changes of detail until it was laid in ruins by the barbarians. But in reality, the imperial institutions from the time of Augustus onwards had passed through a course of continuous development. Diocletian did but accelerate processes which had been in operation from the empire's earliest days, and Constantine left much for his successors to accomplish. Still, these two great organizers did so far change the world which they ruled as to be rightly styled the founders of a new type of monarchy. We will first sketch rapidly the most striking aspects of this altered world, and then consider them one by one somewhat more closely. But our survey must be in the main of a general character, and many details, especially when open to doubt, must be passed over. In particular, the minutia of chronology, which in this region of history are specially difficult to determine, must often be disregarded. The ideal of a balance of power between the princeps and the senate, which Augustus dangled before the eyes of his contemporaries, was never approached in practice. From the first, the imperial constitution bore within it the seed of autocracy, and the plant was not of slow growth. The historian Tacitus was not far wrong when he described Augustus as having drawn to himself all the functions which in the Republic had belonged to the magistrates and to laws. The founder of the empire had studied well the art of concealing his political art, but the pressure of his hand was felt in every corner of the administration. Each princeps was as far above the law as he chose to rise, so long as he did not strain the endurance of the senate and people to the point of breaking. When that point was passed, there was the poor consolation of refusing him his apotheosis, or of branding with infamy his memory. As the possibility of imperial interference was ever present in every section of the vast machine of government, all concerned in its working were anxious to secure themselves by obtaining an order from above. This anxiety is conspicuous in the letters written by Pliny to his master Trajan. Even those emperors who were most citizen-like, civilis as the phrase went, were carried away by the tide. Tacitus exhibits the Senate as eagerly pressing Tiberius to permit the enlargement of his powers. Tiberius, who regarded every precept of Augustus as a law for himself. The so-called Lex Regia Vespasiani shows how constantly the admitted authority of the emperor advanced by the accumulation of precedents. Pliny gave Trajan credit for having reconciled the empire with liberty, but liberty had come to mean little more than orderly and benevolent administration, free from cruel caprice, with some external deference paid to the senate. Developed custom made the rule of Marcus Aurelius greatly more despotic than that of Augustus. Even the emperors of the 3rd century who, like Severus Alexander, made most of the Senate, could not turn back the current. It was long, however, before the subjects of the empire realized that the ancient glory had departed. Down to the time of the emperor Tacitus, Pretenders found their account in posing as senatorial champions, and rulers used the Senate's name as a convenient screen for their crimes. But the natural outcome of the anarchy of the 3rd century was the unveiled despotism of Diocletian. He was the last in a line of valiant soldiers sprung from Illyrian soil, who accomplished the rescue of Rome from the dissolution with which it had been threatened by forces within and by forces without. To him, more than to Aurelian, on whom it was bestowed, belonged by right the title Restorer of the World. For three centuries, the legions had been a standing menace to the very existence of Greco-Roman civilization. They made emperors and unmade them, and devoured the substance of the state, exacting continually lavish largesse at the sword's point. One hope of Diocletian when, following in the steps of Aurelian, he hedged round the throne with pomp and majesty, was that a new awe might shield the civil power from the lawless soldiery. In place of an Augustus, loving to parade as a bourgeois leader of the people, there comes a kind of sultan, with trappings such as the men of the West had been used to associate with the servile East, with the Persians and the Parthians. The ruler of the Roman world wears the oriental diadem, the mere dread of which had brought Caesar to his end.
He is approached as a living god with that adoration from which the souls of the Greeks revolted when they came into the presence of the great king, though Alexander bent them to endure it. Eunuchs are among his greatest officers. Lawyers buttress his throne with an absolutist theory of the constitution which is universally accepted. From Augustus to Diocletian, the trend of the government towards centralization had been incessant. The new monarchy gave to the centralization an intensity and an elaboration unknown before. In the early days of conquest, whether within Italy or beyond its boundaries, the Roman power had attempted no unification of its dominions. As rulers, the Romans had shown themselves thorough opportunists. They tolerated great varieties of local privilege and partial liberty. Their government had followed, almost timidly, the line of least resistance, and had adapted itself to circumstance, to usage, and to prejudice in every part of the empire. Even taxation had been elastic. Before the age of despotism, few matters had ever been regulated by one unvarying enactment for every province. To this great policy, the Romans chiefly owed the rapidity of their successes and the security of their ascendancy. The tendency towards unity was, of course, manifest from the first. But it sprang far less from the direct action of the central government than from the instinctive and unparalleled attraction which the Roman institutions possessed for the provincials, particularly in the West. In part by the extension of Roman and Italian rights to the provinces, in part by the gradual depression of Italy to the level of a province, and in part by interference designed to correct misgovernment, local differences were to a great extent effaced. Septimius Severus, by stationing a legion in Italy, removed one chief distinction between that favored land and the subject regions outside. Under his successor, Caracalla, all communities within the empire became alike Roman. By Diocletian and by Constantine, control from the center was made systematic and organic. Yet absolute uniformity was not attained. In taxation, in legal administration, and in some other departments of government, local conditions still induced some toleration of diversities. Centralization brought into existence with its growth a vast bureaucracy. The organization of the imperial side of the administration, as opposed to the senatorial, became more and more complex, while the importance of the senate in the administrative machinery continually lessened. The expansion and organization of the executive engaged the attention of many emperors, particularly Claudius, Vespasian, Trajan, Hadrian, and Septimius Severus. When the chaos of the third century had been overcome, Diocletian and his successors were compelled to reconstruct the whole service of the empire and a great network of officials, bearing for the most part new titles and largely undertaking new functions, was spread over it. Along with the development of absolutism and the extension of bureaucracy and the unification of administration, had gone certain tendencies which had cut deeply into the constitution of society at large. The boundaries between class and class tended more and more to become fixed and impassable. As the empire decayed, society stiffened, and some approximations were made to the oriental institution of caste. Augustus had tried to give a rigid organization to the circle from which senators were drawn, and had constituted it as an order of nobility passing down from father to son, only to be slowly recruited by imperial choice. Many duties owed to the state tended to become hereditary, and it was made difficult for men to rid themselves of the status which they acquired at birth. The exigencies of finance made membership of the local senates and the municipalities almost impossible to escape. The frontier legions, partly by encouragement and partly by ordinance, were largely filled with sons of the camp. Several causes, the chief of which was the financial system, gave rise to a kind of serfdom, colonatus, which at first attached the cultivators of the soil, and as time went on, approximated to a condition of actual slavery. The provisioning of the great capitals, Rome and Constantinople, and the transportation of goods on public account rendered occupations connected with them hereditary. 
and many inequalities between classes became pronounced. The criminal law placed the honestiores and the tenuiores in different categories. The main features of the executive government, as organized by Diocletian and his successors, must now be briefly described. For the first time, the difference between the prevalently Latin West and the prevalently Greek East was clearly reflected in the scheme of administration. Diocletian ordained, 286, that two Augusti with equal authority should share the supreme power, one making his residence in the eastern, the other in the western portion. The empire was not formally divided between them. They were to work together for the benefit of the whole state. This association of Augusti was not exactly new, but it had never been before formalized so completely. The separation of west from east had been foreshadowed from the early days of the empire. In the first century, it had been found necessary to have a Greek secretary of state, Alabellus Graecus, as well as a Latin secretary, Alabellus Latinus. The civilization of the two spheres, in spite of much interaction, remained markedly different. The municipal life of the eastern regions in which Greek influence predominated was fixed in its characteristics before the Romans acquired their ascendancy, and the impression they made on it was not on the whole great. But they spread their own municipal institutions all over western lands. Although Diocletian's arrangement of the two Augusti was overthrown by Constantine, the inherent incompatibility between the two sections of the empire continued to assert itself, and the separation became permanent in fact, if not in form, on the death of Theodosius. The establishment of Constantinople as the capital rendered the ultimate severance inevitable. Another problem which Diocletian attacked was that of the succession to the throne. Each Augustus was to have assigned to him, 293, a Caesar, who would assist him in the task of government and succeed him on his retirement or death. The transference of power would thus be peaceful, and the violent revolutions caused by the claims of the legions to nominate emperors would cease. But in the nature of things this device could not prosper. The empire followed the course it had taken from the beginning. The dynastic principle strove time after time to establish itself, but dynasties were ever threatened with catastrophe, such had ensued on the deaths of Nero, of Commodus, and of Severus Alexander. But new emperors frequently did homage to heredity by a process of posthumous and fictitious adoption, whereby they grafted themselves onto the line of their predecessors. Apparently, even this phantom of legitimacy had some value for the effect it produced on the public mind. The theory of government now became, as has been said, frankly autocratic. Even Aurelian, a man of simple and soldierly life, had thought well to take to himself officially the title of Lord and God, which private flattery had bestowed upon Domitian. The lawyers established a fiction that the Roman people had voluntarily resigned all authority into the hands of the monarch. The fable was as baseless and as serviceable as that of the social compact received in the 18th century. No person or class held any rights against the emperor. The revenues were his private property. All payments from the treasury were sacred largesses conceded by the divine ruler. So far as the state was concerned, the distinction between the senatorial exchequer, aurarium, and the imperial exchequer, fiscus, disappeared. Certain revenues, as for instance those derived from the confiscated estates of unsuccessful pretenders, were labeled as the emperor's private property, res privita, and others as belonging to his family estate, patrimonium. But these designations were merely formal and administrative. The emperor was the sole ultimate source of all law and authority. The personnel by which he was immediately surrounded in his capital was of vast extent, and the palace was often a hotbed of intrigue. Even in the time of the Severi, the Caesareans, as Dio Cassius names them, were numerous enough to imperil often in the public peace. Another class of imperial servants, the workers at the Mint, had, in the reign of Aurelian, 
raised an insurrection which led to a shedding of blood in Rome, such as had not been witnessed since the age of Sulla. The military basis of imperial power, partly concealed by the earlier emperors, stood fully revealed. Septimius Severus had been the first to wear regularly in the capital the full insignia of military command, previously seen there only on days of triumph. Now every department of the public service was regarded as militia and camp, castra, is the official name for the court. All high officers, with the exception of the Praefectus Urbi, wore the military garb. It is needless to say that officials who were nominally the emperor's domestic servants easily gathered power into their own hands and often became the real rulers of the empire. The line between domestic offices and those which were political and military was never strictly drawn. All higher functions whose exercise required close attention on the emperor's person were covered by the description dignitatis palatinae. Under the early emperors, the great ministers of state were largely freedmen, whose status was rather that of court servants than of public administrators. The great departments of imperial service were gradually freed from their close attachment to the emperor's person. The natural result was that direct personal influence over the ruler often passed into the hands of men whose duties were in name connected only with the daily life of the palace. From the 3rd century onwards, the eastern custom of choosing eunuchs as the most trusted servants prevailed in the imperial household as in the private households of the wealthy. The greatest of these was the Prepositus Sacri Cubiculi, or Great Chamberlain. This officer often wielded the power which had been enjoyed by such men as Parthenius had been under Domitian. The office grew in importance as measured by dignity and precedence, until in the time of Theodosius the Great it was one of the four high offices which conferred on their holders membership of the imperial council, consistorium, and a little later was made equal in honor to the other three. The Palatine servants, high and low, formed a mighty host, which required a special department for their provisioning and another for their tendance in sickness. But exactly how many of them were under the immediate direction, sub dispositione, of the Prepositus Sacri Cubiculi cannot be determined. Some duties fell to him which are hardly suggested by his title. He was in control of the emperor's select and intimate bodyguard, which bore the name of Silentiari, thirty in number, with three decuriones for officers. Curiously, he superintended one division of the vast imperial domains, that considerable portion of them which lay within the province of Cappadocia. Dependent probably on the Prepositus Sacri Cubiculi was the Primicerus Sacri Cubiculi, who appears in the Notitia Dignitatum as possessing the quality of a proconsular. Whether the Castrensis Sacri Palitae was independent or subordinate cannot be determined. Under his rule were a host of pages and lower menials of many kinds, and he had to care for the fabric of the imperial palaces. Also, he had charge of the private archives of the imperial family. The service of the officers described was rather personal to the emperor rather than public in character. We now turn to the civil and military administration as it was refashioned under the new monarchy. The chaos of the period preceding Diocletian's supremacy had finally effaced some of the leading features of the Augustan Principate, which had become fainter and fainter as the empire ran its course. The Senate lost the last remnant of real power. Such of its surviving privileges and dignities as might carry back the mind to the days of its glory were mere shadows without substance. All provinces had become imperial. All functionaries of every class owed obedience to the autocrat alone and looked to him for their career. The old state treasury, the Aurarium, retained its name, but became in practice the municipal exchequer of Rome, which ceased to be the capital of the empire and was merely the first of its municipalities. The army and the civil service alike were filled with officers whose titles and duties would have seemed strange to a Roman of the second century of the empire. The aspect of the provincial government, as ordered by the new monarchy, differed profoundly from that which it had worn in the age of the early Principate. 
To diminish the danger of military revolutions, Diocletian carried to a conclusion a policy which had been adopted in part by his predecessors. The great military commands in the provinces, which had often enabled their holders to destroy or to imperil dynasties or rulers, were broken up, and the old provinces were severed into fragments. Spain, for example, now comprised six divisions, and Gaul, fifteen. Within these fragments, still named provinces, the civil power and the military authority were, as a rule, not placed in the same hands. The divisions of the empire now numbered about 120, as against 45 which existed at the end of Trajan's reign. Twelve of the new sections lay within the boundaries of Italy, and of the old contrast between Italy and the provinces of the Principate, few traces remained. Egypt, hitherto treated as a land apart, was brought within the new organization. The titles of the civil administrators were various. Three, who ruled regions bearing the ancient provincial names of Asia, Africa, and Achaea, were distinguished by the title of proconsul, which had once belonged to all administrators of senatorial provinces. About 36 were known as consulares. This designation ceased to indicate, as of old, the men who had passed the consulship. It was merely connected with the government of the provinces. The consularis became technically a member of the Roman Senate, though he ranked below the ex-consul. So also with the provincial governors who bore the common title of praeses, and the rarer name of corrector. This last appellation belonged, in the 4th century, to the chiefs of two districts in Italy, Apulia, and Lucania, and of three outside. It denoted originally officers who began to be appointed in Trajan's reign to reform the condition of municipalities. The precedence of the correctores among the governors seems to have placed them in the west after the consulares, in the east after the presides. Sometimes the title of proconsul was for personal reasons bestowed on a governor whose province was ordinarily ruled by an officer of lower dignity, but such an arrangement was temporary. The old expressions legatus pro praetore, or procurator, in its application to provincial rulers, went out of use. After the age of Constantine, new and fanciful descriptions of the provincial governors, as of other officers, tended to spring into existence. A few frontier districts were treated, as was the case under the Principate, in an exceptional manner. Their chiefs were allowed to exercise civil as well as military functions, and were naturally described by the ordinary name for an army commander, Dux. The proconsuls possessed some privileges of their own. Two of them, the proconsul of Africa and the proconsul of Asia, were alone among provincial governors entitled to receive their orders from the emperor himself. And the Asian proconsul was distinguished by having under him two deputies, who directed a region known as Hellespontus and the Insulae, or islands lying near the Asiatic coast. All other administrators communicated with the emperor through one or other of four great officers of state, the Praefecti Praetorio. Their title had been originally invented to designate the commander of the Praetorian cohorts, whom Augustus called into existence. The control of these was usually vested in two men. Now and then, three commanders were appointed. Some emperors, disregarding the danger to themselves, allowed a single officer to hold command. Men like Sejanus, under Tiberius, and Plotianus, under Septimius Severus, were practically vice-emperors. As time went on, the office gradually lost its military character. Sometimes one of the commanders was a soldier and the other a civilian. During the reign of Severus Alexander, the great lawyer Ulpian was in sole charge, being the first senator who had been permitted to hold the post. The legal duties of the prefect continued to grow in importance. When the Praetorian cohorts brought destruction on themselves by their support of Maxentius against Constantine, the Praefectus Praetorio became a purely civil functionary. The four Praefecti were distinguished as Praefectus Praetorio, Galliarum, Italiae, Illyrici, and Orientis, respectively. The first administered not only the ancient Gaul, 
but also the Rhine frontier in Britain, Spain, Sardinia, Corsica, and Sicily. The second, in addition to Italy, had under him Raetia, Noricum, Dalmatia, Pannonia, and some regions on the upper Danube, also most of Roman Africa. The third, Dacia, Achaea, and districts near the lower Danube besides Illyricum, properly so called. The fourth, all Asia Minor, insofar as it was not subjected to the proconsul of Asia, with Danube and Thrace, and some lands by the mouth of the Danube. It will be seen that three out of four had the direction of provinces lying on or near the Danube. Probably on their first institution, and for some time afterwards, all the prefecti retained in their own hands the administration of some portions of the great territories committed to their charge. Later, the Illyrian prefect alone had a district, a portion of Dacia, under his own immediate control. Apart from this exception, the prefecti conducted their government through officials subordinated to them. Each prefectal region was divided into great section called dioceses. Each of these was formed by combination of a certain number of provinces, and each was comparable to the more important of the old provinces of the age of the Republic and early Principate. The word diocesis had passed through a long history before the time of Diocletian. The Romans found it existent in their Asiatic dominions, where it had been applied by earlier rulers to an administrative district, especially in relation to legal affairs. The Roman government extended the employment of the term both in the East and in the West, and connected it with other sides of administration besides the legal. Diocletian marked out ten great divisions of the empire to be designated by this title. The numbers of the divisions and their limits were somewhat altered by his successors. At the head of each diocese was placed an officer who bore the name Vicarius, excepting in the eastern prefecture. Here, the Vicarius was after a while replaced by a Comus Orientis, to whom the governor of Egypt was the first subject, though he acquired independent authority later. The treatment of Italy, in the new and extended sense, was peculiar. It constituted a single diocese, but possessed two vicarii, one of whom had his seat in Milan, the other in Rome. This bisection of the Italian prefecture depended on differences in taxation, to which we must recur later. In the diocese Asiana and the diocese Africae, the vicarius was of course responsible not to the prefectus, but to the proconsul. Such were, in broad outline, the features which the civil administration of the empire wore after Diocletian's reforms. End of section 4 Section 5 of Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lewis Heman, Louisville, Kentucky. Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1, Section 5, The Reorganization of the Empire, by J. S. Reed. Some rough idea must be conveyed of the mode in which the scheme was applied to the practical work of government. It must be premised that now, as heretofore, there was no point in the vast and complex machinery of bureaucracy at which the direct interposition of the emperor might not be at any moment brought into play. There was therefore no mechanical subordination of officer to officer, such as would produce an unbroken official chain passing down from the emperor to the lowest official. And even apart from imperial intervention, we must not conceive of the different grades of functionaries as arranged in absolutely systematic subjection, one grade to another. This would have interfered with one principal purpose of the new organization, which aimed at providing the emperor with information about the whole state of his dominions through officers immediately in touch with him at the center of the government. The emperor could not afford to restrict himself to such reports as might reach him through a prefectus praetorio or a proconsul. Thus, 
The Vicari were never regarded as mere agents or deputies of the Praefecti, and the same may be said of other officials. All might be called on to leave the beaten track. The Praefecti Praetorio, though each had his allotted sphere, were still in some sense colleagues, and were required on occasion to take common action. One great aim of the new system was to prevent administrators from accumulating influence by long continuance in the same post, or in any other way. Therefore, functionaries were passed on rapidly from one position to another. Therefore, also except in rare instances, no man was allowed to hold office in the province of his birth. All offices were now paid, and the importance of many was discernible from the amount of the stipend received by the holder. As in earlier times, certain offices conferred on their incumbents what may be regarded as patents of nobility. The nobiliary status arising from office was not hereditary as in an earlier age, yet the halo of the title to some extent covered the official's family. New appellations were invented to decorate the higher offices, whose tenants were graded as illustres, spectabiles, and clarissimi. To the last designation, all senators were entitled. Other expressions as comes, patricius, were less closely bound up with the office. The use of these titles spread gradually. Before the end of the first century, vir clarissimus, parentheses, VC, on inscriptions, parentheses, began to denote the senator. The employment of distinctive titles for high officers of equestrian rank, vir eminentissimus, vir perfectissimus, vir egregius, began with Hadrian, and developed in the time of Marcus Aurelius. The designation vir egregius fell out of use during or soon after Constantine's reign. The tendency of the new organization was to detach many offices from their old connection with the equestrian body, whose importance in the Senate diminished and then rapidly died away. Many changes in the application of these titles to the different offices took place from time to time. The Praefectus Praetorio was the most exalted civil officer in the new empire. His duties were executive, legal, financial, of every description in fact excepting the military. His only service for the army lay in the supply of its material requirements in pay, food, and equipment. He became, in the end, one of the highest of the Viri Illustris. The Praefectus, in whose district the emperor resided, was for the time being of enhanced importance, and was donated as Praefectus Praetorio Praesens. The office had, even before the time of Diocletian, attracted to itself a good deal of criminal jurisdiction. The Praefectus was now not a judge of first instance, but heard appeals from the courts below, within his sphere of action, with the exception of the court of the Vicarius, from whom the appeal went straight to the Emperor. On the other hand, after 331, there was in the ordinary way no appeal against a sentence passed by the Praefectus, who was held to sit as the alter ego of the emperor, parentheses, vice sacra iudicans, parentheses. No other official possessed this privilege. The whole administration of the regents committed to him was passed under review by the prefectus. His supervision of the provisional governors was of the most general kind. Each was compelled to send in twice a year a report on the administration of his province, and particularly on his exercise of jurisdiction. In the selection of governors, the Praefectus had a large share, and he exercised disciplinary power over them. Erring functionaries, both military and civil, could be suspended by him till the Emperor's pleasure was known. He usually advised the Emperor concerning appointments. His control of finance, both on the side of receipts and on that of expenditure, formed a most important part of his duties. All difficulties in the incidence of taxation and in the collection of the taxes came under his consideration, but no officer of the emperor, however highly placed, 
could diminish or increase taxation without the emperor's express sanction. The prefectus was also responsible for the due transport of corn and other necessaries destined for the supply of Rome and Constantinople. Many other functions fell to his lot, among them the superintendents of the state post, parentheses, cursus publicus, parentheses. If we may adapt an ecclesiastical phrase which describes the archdeacon as the oculus episcopi, we may say that the vicarius was the oculus prefecti. He gave a closer eye to details than was possible for his superior within his dioceses. At first, he was perfectissimus, afterwards, spectabilis. The tendency of the rulers after Constantine was to increase his importance at the expense of the prefectus, rather, however, in the field of jurisdiction than in other fields. The vicarius had but little disciplinary power over the rector provinciae. The governor could, in a difficult case, seek advice from the emperor without having recourse to either of his superior officers, though he was bound to inform the vicarius, and the latter could on occasion go straight to the monarch. The court of the vicarius, like that of the prefectus, was an appeal court only. The provincial governor was judge of first instance in all civil and criminal matters, except in the cases of some privileged persons, and in those minor affairs which were left to the magistrates of the municipalities within the province. The small size of the province made it unnecessary that its ruler should travel about to administer justice, as in the earlier time. Causes were heard at the seat of government. Much of the time of the governor was occupied in seeing that imposts were duly collected, and that no irregularities were practiced by subordinates. Responsibility for public order rested primarily with him. The lower grades of civil servants in the provinces were to a very large extent in connection with, and controlled by, the great departments of the imperial service whose chief offices were in the capital. Early in the imperial period, three great bureaus were established, whose presidents were named Ab Epistulus, A Libellus, and A Memoria. These phrases survived into the age of Constantine and after, but denoted the offices, and not their chiefs, whose title was Magister. The departments themselves were now described by the word Scrinium, which had originally denoted a box or desk for containing papers. The word had, therefore, undergone a change of meaning similar to that which had passed over Fiscus, whereby from a basket for holding coin, it came to mean the imperial exchequer. The demarcation of business allotted to the three great scrinia was not always the same. The Magister Memoriae gradually encroached on the functions of the other two heads of departments, and became much the most influential of the three. A fourth scrinium, called the Scrinium Dispositionum, was added. Its magister, parentheses, later called comes, parentheses, was at first inferior to the other three, who belonged to the class of the spectabiles, but was afterwards placed on a level with them. All these magistrate, on being promoted, became vicari. All four were subject to an exalted personage known as the Magister Officiorum, who was a vir illustris. The department known as Ab Epistulis was early divided into two sections distinguished as Ab Epistulis Latinus and Ab Epistulis Graecus. It was originally the great secretariat of the empire. Here were managed all communications touching foreign affairs, and the general correspondence of the government, excepting insofar as it related to the legal and other multifarious petitions addressed to the emperor, appealing for his interference or his favor. These would come not only from officials, but also from private persons, and all fell within the functions of the office a libellis. This bureau absorbed into itself another, which had been specially devoted to legal inquiries, and was called a cognitionibus.
Hence, the Magister Libellorum is described in the Digest by the fuller title Magister Skirniae Libellorum et Sacrarum Cognitionum. The department had famous lawyers, like Papinian and Ulpian, connected with it, and it must often have sought the aid of specialists in other matters belonging to the public service as revenue and finance, for many of the petitions addressed to the rulers sought relief from taxation. The name of the department, A Memoria, implies that its head was the keeper of the emperor's memory. It was, therefore, a record office, but it was much more. It assisted other offices in putting documents into their final shape, and not only recorded the documents, but issued them. The accounts we have of the office make it clear that it took to itself much important business which originally was transacted by other departments. Thus, the Notitia describes the Magister Memoriae as dictating and issuing annotationes, that is to say, brief pronouncements running in the Emperor's name, also as giving answers to supplications, parentheses, preaches, parentheses. Further, he gave to the Emperor's letters, speeches, and general announcements their final form and sent them forth. The Magister Libellorum and the Magister Epistularum must have become, in fact, though not in form, his inferiors. From his office emanated diplomas of appointments, the permission to use the imperial post, and countless other official permits. The Scrinium Dispositionum kept in order all the emperor's engagements, and made the innumerable arrangements necessary for his journeys, and took count of many matters with which he was in touch, being of such a nature as not to come definitely within the purview of other bureaus. All these scrinia were under the control of one of the greatest functionaries of the empire, the Magister Officiorum. His importance grew over a long space of time from small beginnings. His functions encroached greatly on those of the Praefecti Praetorio, and their development is a measure of the jealousy entertained by the emperors for these great officers. The word officium indicates a group of public servants placed at the disposal of a state functionary. The Magister Officiorum is the general master of all such groups. Naturally, he is vir illustris. He selected from the scrinia, in accordance with the elaborate rules of service, the clerks who were required to carry out many sorts of business in the capital and in the provinces. His duties were of many different kinds, through which no connected thread of principle ran. They evidently reached their full compass by an agglomeration which followed lines of convenience merely. One of the most prominent occupations of the Magister lay in his direction of what may be called the secret service of the Empire. He had under him the very important Scola Agentum in Rebus, which was organized by Constantine, or possibly by Diocletian, and replaced a body of men called Frumentari, drawn originally from the corps which had in charge the provisioning of the army. These had acted as secret agents of the government. They were the men by whose means Hadrian, as his biographer says, quote, wormed out all hidden things, end quote. The vast extension of the secret service in the age of Constantine and later was a consequence of the huge increase in the number of officials and of the suspicion which an autocratic ruler naturally entertains towards his subordinates, in part also of a genuine but ineffectual desire to check misgovernment. The term scola is closely connected with the army, and implies a service which is regarded as military in trend, like that of other scolae palatinae. The duties assigned to this scola opened, of course, wide doors through which corruption enters, and it became one of the greatest scourges from which the subjects of the empire suffered. All attempts to keep it in order failed. The number of the officers attached to it was generally enormous. Julian practically disbanded it, retaining only a few of its members, but it soon grew again to its former proportions. The officers belonging to the Scola were arranged in five classes, with more or less mechanical promotion, such as generally prevailed through the imperial service. The members themselves seem to have had some voice in the selection of men for the highest and most responsible duties. <laughs> 
The standing of the Scola became continually more honorable, and members of it rose to provincial governorships and even to still higher positions. The agents in Rebus was ubiquitous, but only some of the more momentous forms of his activity can be mentioned here. An officer called Princeps, drawn from the Scola, was sent to every vicarius and into every province, where he was the chief of the governor's staff of assistance. Parentheses, officium, parentheses. This officer had gone through a course of espionage in lower situations, and his relation to the Magister Officiorum made his proximity uncomfortable for his nominal superior. Indeed, the princeps came to play the part of a sort of mar de palais to the rector provinciae, who tended to become a merely nominal ruler. The princeps and the officium were quite capable of conducting the affairs of the province alone. Hence, we hear of youths being corruptly placed in important governorships, and of these offices being purchased, as in the days of the Republic, only in a different manner. After this provincial service, the princeps usually became a governor of a province himself. At an earlier stage of his career, the agents in Rebus would be dispatched to a province to superintend the imperial post service there and see that it was not in any way abused. This title was then Prepositus Cursus Publicae, or later Curiosus. This service would enable him to play the part of a spy wherever he went. The burden of providing for the post was one of the heaviest which the provincials had to bear, and those who contravened the regulations concerning it were often highly placed officials. That the curiosi, by their espionage, could make themselves intolerable, there is much evidence to show. The agentes in Rebus were also the general messengers of the government, and were continually dispatched, on occasions great or small, to make announcements in every part of the emperor's dominions. While performing this function, they were often the collectors of special donations to the imperial exchequer, and made illegitimate gains of their own, owing to the fear which they inspired. A regulation which is recorded forbidding any agents in Rebus from entering Rome without special permission is eloquent testimony to the reputation which the Scola in general had earned. Among the other miscellaneous duties of the Magister Officiorum, was the supervision of formal intercourse between the empire and foreign communities and princes. Also, the general superintendence of the imperial factories and arsenals, which supplied the army with weapons. The Corps of Guards, parentheses, Scolae Scuteriorum et Gentium, parentheses, who replaced the destroyed Praetorians, were under his command, so that he resembled the Praefectus Praetorio of the earlier empire. And connected with this was a responsibility for the safety for the frontiers, parentheses, limites, parentheses, and control over the military commanders there. Further, the servants who attended to the court ceremonial, parentheses, officium admissionis, parentheses, were under his direction, as were some others who belonged to the emperor's state. His civil and criminal jurisdiction extended over the immense mass of public servants at the capital, with few exceptions, and his voice in selecting officials for service there was potent. In short, no officer had more constant and more confidential relations with the monarch than the Magister Officiorum. He was the most important executive officer at the center of government. The greatest judicial and legal officer was the Quaestor Sacri Paliti. The early history of this officer is obscure, and no acceptable explanation has been found for the use of the title Quaestor in connection with it. The dignity of the Quaestor's functions may be understood from the descriptions given in the literature. Symmachus calls him, quote, the dispenser of petitions and the constructor of laws, end quote, parentheses, arbiter precum, legum conditor, parentheses. The poet Claudian says that he, quote, issued edicts to the world and answers to suppliants, end quote, while Corippus describes him as, quote, the champion of justice who under the emperor's auspices controls legislation and legal principles, end quote, parentheses, jura, parentheses. The quaestor's office, like many others, advanced in importance after its creation, which appears to have taken place not earlier than Constantine's reign. <laughs> 
In the latter part of the 4th century, he took precedence even of the Magister Officiorum, and with one brief interruption, he maintained this rank. The requirements for the office were above all skill in the law and in the art of legal expression. On all legal questions, whether questions of change in law or questions of its administration, the emperor gave his final decision by the voice of the quaestor. No body of servants, parentheses, officium, parentheses, was especially allotted to him, but the screnia were at his service. Indeed, he may be said to have been the intermediary between the scrinia and the emperor. His relations with the heads of the departments Alibellus and Amamoria, and particularly with the latter, must have been very close, but their work was preparatory and subordinate to his so far as legal matters were concerned. The instances in which the Magister Memoriae succeeded in acting independently of the quaestor were exceptional. A share in the appointment to certain of the lesser military offices was also assigned to the quaestor, who kept a record of the names of their holders, which was known as Latriculum Minus. In this duty, he was assisted by a high official of the Scrinio Memoriae, whose title was Latriculensis. There was another body called Tribuni et Notari, not attached to the Scrinia, which was of considerable importance. The service of these functionaries was closely connected with the deliberations of the great imperial council, the Consistorium, which is to be described presently. They had to see that the proper officers carried out the decisions of the council. Their business often brought them into close and confidential relation with the emperor himself. The officer at the head is primicarius, literally one whose name is written first on a wax tablet, prima cara. The title is given to many officers serving in other departments and indicates usually, but not always, high rank. This particular primicarius ranked even higher than the chiefs of the Scrinia and the Castrensis Sacri Polity. According to the Notitia, he has, quote, cognizance of all dignities and administrative offices, both military and civil, end quote. He kept the great list, known as Latriculum Maius, in which were comprised not only the actual tenets of the greater offices, but forms for their appointment, schedules of their duties, and even a catalogue of the different sections of the army and their stations, including the scolae, which served as imperial guards. The reorganization of finance brought into existence a host of officials who either bore new names or old titles to which new duties had been assigned. The great and complex system of taxation initiated by Diocletian and carried further by his successors can here be only sketched in broad outline. Although, like all the institutions of the new monarchy, the scheme of taxation had its roots in the past, the new development in its completed form stands in such marked contrast to old conditions that there is not much to be gained by detailed references to the earlier empire. Before Diocletian's time, the old Aurarium Saturni had ceased to be of imperial importance, and the Aurarium Militare of Augustus had disappeared. The general census of Roman citizens, carried out at Rome, is not heard of after Vespasian's time. Of the ancient revenues of the state, very many were swept away by Diocletian's reform, even the most productive of all, the 5% tax on inherited property, parentheses, Vicesisma hereditatum, parentheses, by which Augustus had subjected Roman citizens in general to taxation. The separate provisional census, of which in Gaul, for example, we hear much during the early empire, was rendered unnecessary. The great and powerful Societatis Publicanorum had dwindled away, though the Publicani were still employed for some purposes. Direct collection of revenue had gradually taken the place of the system of farming. Where any traces of the old system remained, it was subject to strict official supervision. Before Diocletian, the incidence of taxation on the different parts of the empire had been most unequal. 
The reasons for this lay partly in the extraordinary variety of the conditions by which in times past the relation of different portions of the empire to the central government had been fixed when they first came under its sway, partly in republican or imperial favor or disfavor as they afterwards affected the burdens to be endured in different places, partly by the evolutions of the municipalities of different types throughout the Roman dominions. Towns and districts, which once had been immune from imposts or slightly taxed, had become tributary, and vice versa. The reforms instituted by Augustus and carried further by his successors did something towards securing uniformity, but many diversities continued to exist. Some of these were produced by the gift of immunitas, which was bestowed on many civic communities scattered over the empire. Without this gift, even communities of Roman citizens were not exempt from the taxation which marked off the provinces from Italy. In order to understand the purpose of Diocletian's changes in the taxation of the empire, it is necessary to consider the struggle which he and Constantine made to reform the imperial coinage. The difficult task of explaining with exactness the utter demoralization of the currency at the moment when Diocletian ascended the throne cannot be here attempted. Only a few outstanding features can be delineated. The political importance of sound currency has never been more conspicuously shown than in the century which followed the death of Commodus, AD 180. Augustus had given a stability to the Roman coinage which it had never before possessed but he imposed no uniform system on the whole of his dominions. Gold, with one slight exception, he allowed none to mint but himself. But copper he left in the hands of the Senate. Silver he coined himself. While he permitted many local mints to strike pieces in that metal also, as well as in copper. Subsequent history extinguished local diversities and brought about by gradual steps a general system which was not attained till the 4th century. Aurelian deprived the Senate of the power which Augustus had left it. Although the imperial coins underwent a certain amount of depreciation between the time of Augustus and that of the Severi, it was not such as to throw out of gear the taxation and the commerce of the empire. But with Caracalla, a rapid decline set in, and by the time of Aurelian, the disorganization had gone so far that practically gold and silver were demonetized, and copper became the standard medium of exchange. The principal coin that professed to be silver had come to contain no more than 5% of that metal, and this proportion sank afterwards to 2%. What a government gains by making its payments in corrupted coin is always far more than lost in the revenue which it receives. The debasement of the coinage means a lightening of taxation, and it is never possible to enhance the nominal amount receivable by the exchequer so as to keep pace with the depreciation. The effect of this in the Roman Empire was greater than it would have been at an earlier time, since there is reason to believe that much of the revenue formerly payable in kind had been transmuted into money. A measure of Aurelian had the effect of multiplying by eight such taxes as were to be paid in coin. As the chief professing silver coin had twenty years earlier contained eight times as much silver as it had then come to contain, he claimed that he was only exacting what was justly due, but his subjects naturally cried out against his tyranny. No greater proof of the disorganization of the whole financial system could be given than lies in the fact that the treasury included sackloads parentheses, foles, parentheses, of the Antoniani, first coined by Caracalla, which were intended to be silver, but were now all but base metal only. These foles passed from hand to hand, unopened. Diocletian's attempts to remove these mischiefs were not altogether fortunate. He made experiment after experiment, aiming at that stability of the currency which had, on the whole, prevailed for two centuries after the reforms of Augustus, but never reaching it. Finally, discovering that the last change he had made led to general raising of prices, he issued the celebrated edict of AD 301, by which the charges for all commodities were fixed, the penalty for transgression being death. <laughs>
Constantine was forced to handle afresh the tangled problem of the currency. The task was rendered especially difficult by the fresh debasement of coinage, which was perpetrated by Maxentius while he was supreme in Italy. It may be said at once that the goal of Diocletian's efforts was never reached by Constantine. He did indeed alter the weight of the gold piece, which now received the name of Solidus, and it continued in circulation practically unchanged for centuries. But this gold piece was to all intents and purposes not a coin, for when payments were made in it, they were reckoned by weight. The Solidus was in effect only a bit of bullion, the fineness of which was conveniently guaranteed by the imperial stamp. The same is true of Constantine's silver pieces. The only coins which could be paid and received by their number, without weighing, were those contained in the foles, of which mention was made above, and the word foles was now applied to the individual coins as well as to the whole sack. It had proved to be impossible to restore the monetary system which had prevailed in the first and second centuries of the empire. But the tide of innovation was at length stayed, and this in itself was no small boon. End of section 5。section 6 of Cambridge medieval history volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org cambridge medieval history volume one section six chapter two the reorganization of the empire by j s reed part three the line taken by the reform of diocletian in the scheme of taxation was partly marked out for him by the anarchy of the third century which led to the great debasement of the coinage described above and to many oppressive exactions of an arbitrary character the lowering of the currency had disorganized the whole revenue and expenditure of the government where dues were receivable or stipends payable of a fixed nominal amount these had largely lost their value a natural consequence was that payments both to be made and to be received were ordered by diocletian to be reckoned in the produce of the soil and not in coin during the era of confusion a phrase in dictio had come into use to denote a special requisition made upon the provincials over and above their stated dues what diocletian did was to make what had been irregular into a regular and general impost subjecting all provincials to it alike and abolishing the unequal tributes of different kinds which had been previously required the result was an enormous levelling of taxation throughout the provinces and to some extent the immunity of italy itself was withdrawn but the sum to be raised from year to year was not uniform it depended on an announcement to which the word indictio was applied issued by the emperor for each year hence the number of indictionis proclaimed by an emperor became a convenient means for denoting the years of his reign the assessment of communities and individuals was managed by an elaborate process the newly arranged burdens fell on land the territorium attached to every town was surveyed and the land classified according to its use for growing grain or producing oil or wine a certain number of acres e u gera a variable land was called a e ugum the number varied partly according to the quality of the soil which was roughly graded partly according to the province in which it was situated in the case of oil the taxable unit was often arrived at by counting the number of olive trees and this was sometimes the case with vines the e ugum 
was however supposed to be fixed in accordance with the limits of one man's labor and therefore caput person and iugum from the point of view of revenue became convertible terms but men and women and slaves and cattle were taxed separately and in addition to the tax on the land each man or slave on a farm counted as one caput and each woman as half a caput a certain number of cattle constituted also a iugum and thus there was no need to divide up the pasture lands as the arable lands were divided meadows were rated for the supply of fodder the total requirements of the government were stated in the indictio and every community had to contribute in accordance with the number of taxable units which the survey had disclosed all the produce which the taxpayers handed over was stored in great government barns horia the system of collection though decentralized was bad the decurions or senators of each town or the ten chief men of each town de Kem primi were responsible for handing over to the government all that was due a revision took place every five years and was generally carried through with much unfairness and oppression of the poor landholders apparently a fresh survey was not made but evidence taken by the town offices and the town itself from three twelve onwards we find a fifteen-year indiction period which came to be largely used as a chronological instrument it would seem that every fifteenth year a reallotment of taxes was made which was based on actual survey but evidence for this is scanty an imperial revenue officer called Kensator was restricted to the duty of receiving the dues from a community as a whole outside imperial officers were called in to assist in the collection of dues from recalcitrant taxpayers this happened at first occasionally then regularly naturally another door was thus opened to oppression from which the rich would manage to escape more lightly than the poor the special arrangement made by diocletian for italy will be explained later also the exemptions accorded to privileged classes of individuals along with the payment of government dues in kind went the payment of stipends in kind a certain amount of corn wine meat and other necessaries grouped together constituted a unit to which the name anona was applied and salaries military and civil were largely calculated in anoni where allowance was made for horses the amount granted for each was called capitum when stability was in some degree secured for the currency these anoni were again expressed in money by a valuation called adi ratio the government to be on safety's side of course exacted as a rule more produce from the soil than was needed for use and the excess was turned into money naturally at low prices in addition to the burdens on the land many other imposts were levied the maintenance of the post service along the main roads was most oppressive in the towns every trade was taxed the contribution bearing the name of lustralis collatio or chrysargyrum the customs dues at the ports and transit dues at the frontier were maintained revenues were derived from government monopolies in mines forests salt factories and other possessions some of the old republican imposts such as the tax on manumitted slaves still survived persons of distinction were subject to special exactions imperial senators paid several dues especially the so-called arm oblaticum which like many inevitable forms of taxation professed in its name to be a free will offering senators of municipal towns de curionis were weighted both by local and by imperial burdens every five years of his reign the emperor celebrated a festival at which he dispensed large sums to the army and to civil functionaries at the same time the decuionis of the municipalities had to pay an oppressive tax known as arum caroni aurium the beginnings of which go right back to the time of the republic as is shown below certain trading corporations were hereditarily bound to assist in the provisioning of the two capitals and some other miscellaneous services were similarly treated 
from the third century the officer who in each province looked after the imperial revenue whose earlier title was procurator began to be called rationalis but under diocletian's system each governor became the chief financial officer in his province for each diocese there was appointed a rationalis summi rei in which name summi rei refers to the complex of provinces forming the diocese the great imperial minister of finance at the centre bore the same name at first summa race in his case indicated the whole empire but the title comus sacrarum largitionum came into use in the reign of constantine this officer advanced from the rank of perfectissimus to a high place among the illustrious the appellation comus came to be given to all the chief financial officers in the diocese of the east and to some of those in the west while others continued to bear the name rationalis disputes between taxpayers and the lower government financial officers were doubtless decided in the last resort by the comus sacrarum largitionum a number of treasury officials and officers of the mint were under his orders in certain places rome milan lugdunum london and others sub-treasuries of the government were maintained there were also factories for the supply to the court of many fabrics all these the comus had under his charge and he was in touch with the administrators of all public income and expenditure throughout the empire the emperor had revenues which he distinguished as personal to himself rather than public although they doubtless were largely expended on imperial administration these personal revenues were derived from two sources distinguished as race privata and patrimonium and administered to some extent by different staffs in theory the patrimonium consisted of property which might be regarded as belonging to the emperor apart from the crown while the race privata attached to the crown itself but these distinctions were of no great practical value the imperial estates and possessions had come to be enormous and covered large parts of some provinces we have seen that the control of the imperial domains in one province cappadocia was entrusted to the quaestor sacri cubiculi the concentration of these immense estates in the hands of the ruler had an important effect upon the general evolution of society in the empire these properties had largely accrued by confiscation mainly as a consequence of struggles for the supreme power the head of the administration of the race privata designated as in the regular army the members of the body were raised far above the ordinary soldier by their personnel their privileges their pay in some cases equal to that of civil officials of the high grade by their equipment and by the estimation in which they were held the historian ammianus marcellinus served in their ranks they were divided into sections called scoli still another corps of imperial guards was created by constantine consisting of scoli palatini distinguished as scoli scutoriorum who were romans and scoli gentilium who were barbarians they were detached from the general army organization and were under the orders of the magister officiorum their history was not unlike that of the praetorians they became equally turbulent and equally inefficient as soldiers with the new organization of the army there sprang up new military offices of high importance with new names constantine created two high officers as chief commanders of the mobile army a magister equitum and a magister pedidum their position resembled that of the praefecti praetorio of the early empire in several respects they were immediately dependent on the emperor and also from the nature of their commands on one another but circumstances and time changed their duties and their numbers they had sometimes to take the field when the emperor was not present and the division between the infantry command and the cavalry command thus broke down hence the titles magister equitum et peditum and magister utri usque militae or magister militum simply the jealousy which the emperors naturally entertained for all high officers caused considerable variations in the position and importance of these magistri 
after the middle of the fourth century the necessary connection of the magistry with the emperor's person had ceased and the command of a magister generally embraced the diocesis within which war occurred or threatened where the emperor was there would be two magistri called precentalis either distinguished as commanders of infantry and cavalry or bearing the title of magistri u triusque militii precentalis but in the fifth century the emperor was generally in practice a military nonentity and was in the hands of one magister who was not unfrequently the real ruler of the empire as was the case with all high officials the magistri exercised jurisdiction over those under their dispositio not only in matters purely military but in cases of crime and even to some extent in connection with civil proceedings the lower commanders also possessed similar jurisdiction but the details are not known appeal was to the emperor who delegated the hearing as a rule to one or other of the highest civil functionaries no view of the great imperial hierarchy of officials would be complete which did not take account of the new title comus its application followed no regular rules in the earlier latin it was used somewhat loosely to designate men who accompanied a provincial governor and were attached to his staff cohorts especially such as held no definite office connected with administration whether military or civil such unofficial members of the staff seem especially to have assisted the governor in legal matters and in time they were paid and were punishable under the laws against extortion in the provinces in the early empire the title comus begins to be applied in no very precise manner to persons attached to the service of the emperor or of members of the imperial family but only slowly did it acquire an official significance inscriptions of the reign of marcus aurelius show a change as many persons were assigned the title in this one reign as in all the preceding reigns put together probably at this time began the bestowal of the title on military as well as legal assistance of the emperor and soon its possessors were chiefly military officers who after serving with the emperor took commands on the frontier then from the end of the reign of severus alexander to the early years of constantine the description comus augusti was abolished for human beings but attached to divinities constantine restored it to its mundane employment and used it as an honorific designation for officers of many kinds who were not necessarily in the immediate neighbourhood of an augustus or caesar but were servants of the augustus or augusti and caesars generally that is to say might occupy any position in the whole imperial administration constantine seems to have dispatched comitus not all of the same rank or importance to provinces or parts of the empire concerning which he wished to have confidential information later they appear in most districts and the ordinary rulers are in some degree subject to them and they hear appeals and complaints which otherwise would have been laid before the prefecta praetorio the comitus pro winciarum afford a striking illustration of the manner in which offices were piled up upon offices in the vain attempt to check corruption and misgovernment in the immediate neighbourhood of the court the name comus was attached to four high military officers the magister equitum and magister pedidum and the commanders of the domestici equitus and the domestici pedidus also to four high civil officers the high treasurer comus sacrarum largitionum and the controller of the privy purse comus rerum praevatarum also the quaestor sacri palatii and the magister officiorum these high civil functionaries appear as comitus consistoriani being regular members of the privy council consistorium before the end of constantine's reign the words connecting the comus with the emperor and the caesars drop out possibly because the imperial rulers were deemed to be too exalted for any form of companionship and man is now not comus augusti but comus merely or with words added to identify his duties as for instance when the district is stated within which a military or civil officer acts on whom the appellation has been bestowed the former necessary connection of the comus with the court having ceased the name was vulgarized and connected with offices of many kinds sometimes of a somewhat lowly nature in many cases it was not associated with duties at all but was merely titular 
as a natural result comitis were classified in three orders of dignity primi secundi tertii ordinis admission to the lowest rank was eagerly coveted and often purchased because of the immunity from public burdens which the boon carried with it constantine also adapted the old phrase patricius to new uses the earlier emperors first by special authorization later merely as emperors had raised families to patrician rank but the result was merely a slight increase in social dignity from constantine's time onwards the dignity was rarely bestowed and then the patricii became a high and exclusive order of nobility they had precedence next to the emperor with the exception of the consuls actually in office their titles did not descend to their sons the best known of the patricii are some of the great generals of barbarian origin who were the last hopes of the crumbling empire the title lasted long it was bestowed on charles martel and was known later in the byzantine empire at the centre of the great many-storied edifice of the bureaucracy was the consistorium or most honourable privy council there was deep rooted in the roman mind the idea that neither private citizen nor official should decide on important affairs without taking the advice of those best qualified to give it this feeling gave rise to the great advising body for the magistrates the senate to the jury who assisted in criminal affairs to the bench of councillors drawn from his staff who gave aid to the provincial governor and also to the loosely constituted gathering of friends whose opinion the pater familius demanded to every one of these groups the word concilium was applicable it was natural that the early emperor should have their concilium the constitution of which gradually became more and more formal and regular hadrian gave a more important place than heretofore to the juris consults among his advisers for a while a regular paid officer called conciliarius existed in diocletian's time the old name concilium was supplanted by consistorium the old advisers of the magistrates sat on the bench with them and therefore sometimes bore the name accessories but it was impious to be seated in the presence of the new divinized rulers and from the practice of standing consistory the council derived its new name from constantine the council received a more definite frame as shown above certain officers became comitis consistoriani but these officers were not always the same after constantine's reign and additional persons were from time to time called in for particular business the prefectus praetorio precens or in comitatu would usually attend the consistorium was both a council of state for the discussion of knotty imperial questions and also a high court of justice though it is difficult to determine exactly what cases might be brought before it probably that depended on the emperor's will it is necessary that something should be said of the position which the two capitals rome and constantinople held in the new organization and of the traces which still hung about italy of its older historical privileges the old roman senate was allowed a nominal existence with a changed constitution and powers which were rather municipal than imperial of the old offices whose holders once filled the senate the consulship praetorship and quaestorship survived while the tribunate and the aedileship died out two consularis ordinarii were named by the emperor who would sometimes listen to recommendations from the senators the years continued to be denoted by the consular names and to add dignity to the office the emperor or members of the imperial family would sometimes hold it the tenure of the office was brief and the consulus suffecti during the year were selected by the senate with the emperor's approval but to be consul suffectus was of little value even from a personal point of view a list of nominations for the praetorship and quaestorship was laid by the prefectus urbi before the emperor for confirmation apart from these old offices many of the new dignitatis carried with them membership of the ordo senatorius ultimately all officials who were clarissimi that is to say who possessed the lowest of the three noble titles belonged to it thus it included not merely the highest functionaries as the principal military officers the civil governors and the chiefs of bureau but many persons lower down in the hierarchy of office for example all the comitus the whole body must have comprised some thousands 
but a man might be a member of the ordo without being actually a senator only the higher functionaries and priests and the consularis described above with possibly a few others actually took part in the proceedings the actual senate and the ordo were distinguished by high-sounding titles in official documents and emperors would occasionally send communications to the senate about high matters and make pretense of asking its advice out of respect for its ancient prestige but its business was for the most part comparatively petty and chiefly confined to the immediate needs of the city but every now and then it was convenient for the ruler to expose the senate to the odium of making unpopular decisions as in cases of high treason and when pretenders rose or changes of government took place the favour of this ancient body still carried with it a certain value among the chief functions of the senators was the supervision of the supply of panis at kerkensis provisions and amusements for the capital the games were chiefly paid for by the holders of the consulship praetorship and quaestorship the obligation resting on the praetorship was the most serious and therefore nomination to this magistracy took place many years in advance that the money might be ready naturally these burdens became to a large extent compulsory and so even women who had inherited from a senator had to supply money for such purposes rich men of course exceeded the minimum largely with a view to display the old privilege still attached to rome of receiving corn from africa diocletian divided italy into two districts of which the northern and nonaria regio paid tribute for support of the court at milan while the southern diocesis romi or suburbicaria regio supplied wine cattle and some of the necessaries for the capital senators as such in the senatorius ordo were subject to special taxation as well as the ordinary taxation of the provinces with exception perhaps of the arum coronarium the folus senatorius was a particular tax on senatorial lands and even a landless senator had to pay something the arum obloticium already mentioned was specially burdensome the most important officer connected with the senate was the prefectus urbi his office had grown steadily in importance during the whole existence of the empire and from the time of constantine its holder was weir illustris he was the only high official of the empire who continued to wear the toga and not the military garb he was at the head of the senate and was the intermediary between that body and the emperor the powers of this office were extraordinary the members of the senate resident in rome were under his criminal jurisdiction there was an appeal to him from all the lesser functionaries who dealt with legal matters in the first instance not only in the capital but in a district extending one hundred miles in every direction his control spread over every department of business he was the chief guarding of public security and had the cohortus urbani as well as the praefectus vigilum under his command the provisioning of the city was an important part of his duty and the praefectus anoni acted under his orders a whole army of officials many of them bearing titles which would have been strange to the republic and early empire assisted him in looking after the water supply controlling trade and the markets and the traffic on the river in maintaining the river banks and taking account of the property of senators in many other departments of affairs it is difficult to say how far his position was affected by the presence in the city of a corrector and a vicarius of the praefectus praetorio the material welfare of rome was at least abundantly cared for by the new monarchy the city had already grown accustomed to the loss of dignity caused by the residence of the emperors in cities more convenient for the purposes of government but the foundation of constantinople must have been a heavy blow the institutions of the old rome were to a great extent copied in the new there was a senate subject to the same obligations as in rome most of the magistracies were repeated but until three fifty nine no praefectus urbi seemed to have existed at constantinople elaborate arrangements were made for placing the new city on a level with the old as regards tributes of corn wine and other necessaries from the provinces the more frequent presence of the ruler gave to the new capital a brilliance which the old must have envied so far the machinery of the new government in its several parts has been described we must now consider in outline what was its total effect upon the inhabitants of the empire 
the inability of the ruler to assure good government to his subjects was made conspicuous by the frequent creation of new offices whose object was to curb the corruption of the old the multiplication of the functionaries in close touch with the population rendered oppression more certain and less punishable than ever lactantius declares with pardonable exaggeration that the number of those who lived on the taxes was as great as the number who paid them the evidence of official rapacity is abundant the laws thundered against it in vain oftentimes it happened that illegitimate exactions were legalized in the empty hope of keeping them within bounds penalties expressed in laws were plain enough and numerous enough for corruption in a province not only the governor but his whole officium were liable to make heavy recompense and the comparative powerlessness of the governor is shown by the fact that the officium is more heavily mulcted than its head but a downtrodden people rarely will or can bring legal proof against its oppressors nothing but extensive arbitrary dismissal and punishment of his servants by the emperor without insistence on forms of law would have met the evil as it was corruption reigned through the empire with little check and the illicit gains of the emperor's servants added to the strain imposed by the heavy imperial taxation thus the benefit which the provincials had at first received by the substitution of imperial for republican government was more than swept away their absorption into the roman polity on terms of equality with their conquerors brought with it degradation and ruin during the fourth century that extraordinary development was completed whereby society was reorganized by a demarcation of classes so rigid that it became extremely difficult for any man to escape from that condition of life into which he was born in the main but not altogether this result was brought about by the fiscal system when the local senates or their leaders were made responsible for producing to the government the quota of taxation imposed on their districts it became necessary to prevent the members discurionis or curialis from escaping their obligations by passing into another path of life and also to compel the sons to walk in their father's footsteps but the maintenance of the local ordo was necessary also from the local as well as the imperial point of view the magistracies involved compulsory as well as voluntary payments for local objects and therefore those capable of filling them must be thrust into them by force if need were every kind of magistracy in every town of the empire and every official position in connection with any corporate body whether priestly college or trade guild or religious guild brought with it expenditure for the benefit of the community and on this in great part the ordinary life of every town depended the theodosian coach shows that the absconding decuria was in the end treated as a runaway slave five gold pieces were given to any one who would haul him back to his duties in time the members also of all or nearly all professional corporations collegia or corpora were held to duties by the state and the burden of them descended from father to son the evolution by which these free unions for holding together in a social brotherhood all those who followed a particular occupation were turned into bodies with the stamp of caste upon them is to be traced with difficulty in the extent inscriptions and the legal literature here is everywhere the fiscal system instituted by diocletian was a powerful agent a large part of the natural fruits of the earth passed into the hands of government and a vast host of assistance was needed for transport and distribution and the organization for maintaining the food supply at rome and constantinople became more and more elaborate for the annona alone many corporations had to give service in most cases easily divined from their names as na we tu lauriae frumentariae mercatoris oliariae suiariae pecuariae pistoris borariae porcinariae and numerous others similar bodies were connected with public works with police functions as the extinction of fires with government operations of numerous kinds in the mints the mines the factories for textiles and arms and so on in the early empire the service rendered to the state was not compulsory and partly by rewards such as immunity from taxation partly by pay the government was willingly served but in time the burdens became intolerable state officers ultimately controlled the minutest details connected with these corporations and the tasks imposed did not entirely proceed from the imperial departments 
the curie alice of the towns could enforce assistance from the local collegia within their boundaries and the tentacles of the great octopus of the central government were spread over the provinces in the fourth and later centuries the restrictions on the freedom of these corporations were extraordinarily oppressive egress from inherited membership was inhibited by the government except in rare instances ingress as into the class of curialis was directly or indirectly compulsory the colleges differ greatly in dignity in some as in that of the naviculariae even senators might be concerned and office-holders might obtain among their rewards the rank of roman knight on the other hand the bakers pistorus approached near the condition of slavery marriage for instance outside their own circle was forbidden whereas in other cases it was only rendered difficult property which had once become subject to the duties required of a collegium could hardly be released the end was that collegiati or corporati all over the empire took any method they could find of escaping from their servitude and the law's severest punishments could not check the movement if we may believe some late writers thousands of citizens found life in barbarian lands more tolerable than in the roman empire the status of other classes in the community also tended to become hereditary this was the case with the officialis and the soldiers though here compulsion was not so severe but the tillers of the ground colonae were more hardly treated than any other class it became impossible for them without breach of the law to tear themselves away from the soil of the locality within which they were born the evolution of this peculiar form of serfdom which existed for the purposes of the state is difficult to trace many causes contributed to its growth and final establishment as the extension of large private and especially of vast imperial domains the imitation of the german half-free land tenure when barbarians were settled at litai or inquilini within the empire the influence of egyptian and other eastern land customs but above all the drastic changes in the imperial impost which diocletian introduced the cultivator's principal end in life was to ensure a contribution of natural products for the revenue hence it was a necessity to chain him to the ground and in the law books adscriptipcius is the commonest title for him the details of the scheme of taxation given above show how it must have tended to diminish population for every additional person even a slave increased the contribution which each holding must pay the owners of the land were in the first instance responsible but the burdens of course fell ultimately and in the main on the agricultural workers the temporary loss of provinces to the invader the failure of harvest in any part of the empire the economic effects of pestilence and other accidents all led to greater sacrifices on the part of those provinces which were not themselves affected the exactions became heavier and heavier the punishments for attempts to escape from duty more and more severe and yet flight and disappearance of colonae took place on a large scale by the end of the fourth century it was possible for lawyers to say of this unhappy class that they were almost in the condition of slaves and a century or so later that the distinction between them and slaves no longer existed that they were slaves of the land itself from which they were born in many other ways under the new monarchy the citizens of the empire were treated with glaring inequality the gradations of official station were almost as important in the general life of the empire as they now are in china and they were reflected in titular phrases some of which have been given above etiquette became most complicated even the emperor was bound to exalt the forms of address in his communications with his servants or with groups of persons within his empire your sublimity your magnificence your loftiness were common salutations for the greater officers the ruler did not disdain to employ the title parents in addressing some of them the innumerable new titles which the empire had invented were highly valued and much paraded by their possessors even the titles of offices and the municipalities great hardship must have been caused to the lower ranks of the taxpayers by the extensive relief from taxation which was accorded to hosts of men in the service of the government nominal or real as part payment for the duties which they performed or were supposed to perform with these immunities as with everything else in the empire there was much corrupt dealing the criminal law became a great respecter of persons not only was the jurisdiction over the upper classes separated at many points from the that over the lower but the lower were subject to punishments from which the upper were free 
gradually the empire drifted farther and farther away from the old republican principle that crimes as a rule are to be punished in the same way whoever among the citizens commits them a sharp distinction was drawn between the more honourable onestioris and the more humble humilioris or plebii the former included the imperial ordo senatorius the equites the soldier class generally and veterans and the local senators decurionis the honestioris could not be executed without the emperor's sanction and if executed were exempt from crucifixion a form of punishment altogether abolished by the christian emperors they could not be sentenced to penal servitude in mines or elsewhere nor could they be tortured in the course of criminal proceedings excepting for treason magic and forgery a general survey of roman government in the fourth and later centuries undoubtedly leaves a strong impression of injustice inequality and corruption leading fast to ruin but some parts of the empire did maintain a fair standard of prosperity even to the verge of the general collapse the two greatest problems in history how to account for the rise of rome and how to account for a fall never have been perhaps never will be thoroughly solved end of section six section seven of cambridge medieval history volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1, Section 7 Chapter 3 Constantine's Successors to Jovian and the Struggle with Persia by Norman H. Baines Part 1 Death had surprised Constantine when preparing to meet Persian aggression on the eastern frontier, and it seems certain that the emperor had made no final provision for the succession to the throne, though later writers professed to know of a will which parceled out the Roman world among the members of his family. During his lifetime, his three sons had been created Caesars, and while for his nephew Hannibalianus he had fashioned a kingdom in Asia, to his nephew Dalmatius had been assigned the Ripa Gothica. Possibly we are to see in these latter appointments an attempt to satisfy discontent at court. It may be that Optatus and Ablabius espousing the cause of a younger branch of the imperial stock, had forced Constantine's hand, and that it was for this interference that they afterwards paid the penalty of their lives. But it would seem a more probable suggestion that the Persian danger was thought to demand an older and more experienced governor than Constantius, while the boy Constance was deemed unequal to withstand the Goths in the north. At least the plan would appear to have been, in substance, that of a threefold division of spheres itself suggested by administrative necessity. Constantine was true to the principle of Diocletian, and it was only a superficial view which saw in this devolution of the central power a partition of the Roman Empire. Thus, on the emperor's death, there followed an interregnum of nearly four months. Constantine had, however, been successful in inspiring his soldiers with his own dynastic views. They feared new tumult and internal struggle, and in face of the twenty-year-old Constantius felt themselves to be the masters. The armies agreed that they would have none but the sons of Constantine to rule over them, and at one blow they murdered all the other relatives of the dead emperor, save only the child Julian and Gallus, the future Caesar. In the latter's case, men looked to his own ill health to spare the executioner. At the same time perished Optatus and Ablabius. On September 9, 337, Constantius, Constantine II, and Constance each assumed the title of Augustus as joint emperors. His contemporaries were unable to agree how far Constantius was to be held responsible for this assassination. He alone of the sons of Constantine was present in the capital. It was he who stood to gain most by the deed. The property of the victims fell into his hands, while it was said that he himself regarded his ill success in war and his childlessness as heaven's punishment 
and that this murder was one of the three sins which he regretted on his deathbed. In later times, some, though considering the slaughter as directly inspired by the emperor, have yet held him justified, and have viewed him as the victim of a tragic necessity of state. Certainty is impossible, but the circumstances suggest that inaction and not participation is the true charge against Constantius. The army which made and unmade emperors was determined that there should be no rival to question their choice. The massacre had fatal consequences. It was the seed from which sprang Julian's mistrust and ill will. In a panegyric written for the emperor's eye, he might admit the plea of compulsion, but the deep-seated conviction remained that he was left an orphan through his cousin's crime. In the summer of 338, the new rulers assembled in Pannonia, or possibly at Viminacium in Dacia, not far from the Pannonian frontier, to determine their spheres of government. According to their father's division, it would seem Spain, Britain, and the two Gauls fell to Constantine. The two Italies, Africa, Illyricum, and Thrace, were subjected to Constans, while southward, from the Propontis, Asia, and the Orient, with Pontus and Egypt, were entrusted to Constantius. It was thus to Constantius that, on the death of Hannibalianus, Armenia and the neighboring allied tribes naturally passed. But with this addition, the eastern Augustus appears to have remained content. The whole of the territory subject to Dalmatius, that is, the Ripa Gothica, which probably comprised Dacia, Mysia one and two, and Scythia, perhaps even Pannonia and Noricum, went to swell the share of Constance, who was now but fifteen years of age. But though both the old and the new Rome were thus in the hands of the most youthful of the three emperors, the balance of actual power still seemed heavily weighted in favor of Constantine, the ruler of the West. Indeed, he appears to have assumed the position of guardian over his younger brother. It may be difficult to account for the moderation of Constantius, but Julian points out that a war with Persia was imminent, the army was disorganized, and the preparations for the campaign insufficient. Domestic peace was the empire's great need, while Constantius himself really strengthened his own position by renouncing further claims. To widen his fear of government might have only served to limit his moral authority. Further, he was perhaps unwilling to demand for himself a capital in which his kinsmen had been so recently murdered. His self-denial should prove his innocence. During the next thirteen years, three great and more or less independent interests absorbed the energies of Constantius, the welfare and doctrine of the Christian Church, the long-drawn and largely ineffective struggle against Persia, and lastly, the assertion and maintenance of his personal influence in the affairs of the West. It was to Asia that Constantius hastened after his meeting with his co-rulers. Before his arrival, Nisibis had successfully withstood a Persian siege, autumn 337 or spring 338, and the emperor at once made strenuous efforts to restore order and discipline among the Roman forces. Profiting by his previous experience, he organized a troop of mail-clad horsemen after the Persian model, the wonder of the time, and raised recruits both for the cavalry and infantry regiments. He demanded extraordinary contributions from the eastern provinces, enlarged the river flotillas, and generally made his preparations for rendering effective resistance to Persian attacks. The history of this border warfare is a tangled tale, and our information scanty and fragmentary. In Armenia, the fugitive king and those nobles who with him were loyal to Rome were restored to their country, but for the rest, the campaigns resolved themselves, in the main, into the successive forays across the frontiers of Persian or Roman troops. Though Ludi Persici, 13th to 17th May, were founded, 
though court orators could claim that the emperor had frequently crossed the Tigris, had raised fortresses on its banks, and laid waste the enemy's territory with fire and sword, yet the lasting results of these campaigns were sadly to seek. Now an Arab tribe would be induced to make common cause with Rome, as in 338, and to harry the foe. Now a Persian town would be captured, and its inhabitants transported and settled within the empire. But it was rare, indeed, for the armies of both powers to meet face to face in the open field. Constantius persistently declined to take the aggressive. He hesitated to risk any great engagement, which, even if successful, might entail a heavy loss in men whom he could ill afford to spare. Of one battle alone have we any detailed account. Sapor had collected a vast army. Conscripts of all ages were enlisted, while neighboring tribesmen served for Persian gold. In three divisions the host crossed the Tigris, and by the emperor's orders the frontier guards did not dispute the passage. The Persians occupied an entrenched camp at Hylia or Elia near Singera, while a distance of some 150 states lay between them and the Roman army. Even on Saper's advance, Constantius, true to his defensive policy, awaited the enemy's attack. It may be, as Libanius asserts, that Rome's best troops were absent at the time. Beneath their fortifications, the Persians had posted their splendid mailed cavalry, the cataphracti, and upon the ramparts, archers were stationed. On a midsummer morning, probably in the year 344, possibly 348, the struggle began. At midday, the Persians feigned flight in the direction of their camp, hoping that thus their horsemen would charge upon an enemy disorganized by long pursuit. It was already evening when the Romans drew near the fortifications. Constantius gave orders to halt until the dawn of the new day, but the burning heat of the sun had caused a raging thirst. The springs lay within the Persian camp, and the troops, with little experience of their emperor's generalship, refused to obey his commands and resume the attack. Clubbing the enemy's cavalry, they stormed the palisades. Saper fled for his life to the Tigris, while the heir to his throne was captured and put to death. As night fell, the victors turned to plunder and excess, and under cover of the darkness the Persian fugitives reformed and won back their camp. But success came too late, their confidence was broken, and with the morning the retreat began. Turning to the history of the West, after the meeting of the Augusti in 338, it would appear that Constantine forthwith claimed an authority superior to that of his co-rulers. He even legislated for Africa, although this province fell within the jurisdiction of Constance. The latter, however, soon asserted his complete independence of his elder brother, and in autumn, 338 perhaps, after a victory on the Danube, assumed the title of Sarmaticus. At this time, 339, he probably sought to enlist the support of Constantius, surrendering to the latter Thrace and Constantinople. Disappointed of his hopes, it would seem that the ruler of the West now demanded for himself both Italy and Africa. Early in 340, he suddenly crossed the Alps, and at Aquileia rashly engaged the advanced guard of Constance, who had marched from Nysus in Dacia, where news had reached him of his brother's attack. Constantine, falling into an ambush, perished, and Constance was now master of Britain, Spain, and the Gauls, before April 9, 340. He proved himself a terror to the barbarians, and a general of untiring energy, who traveled incessantly, making light of extremes of heat and cold. In 341 and 342, he drove back an inroad of the Franks, and compelled that restless tribe, for whom inaction was a confession of weakness, to conclude a peace. He disregarded the perils of the English Channel in winter, and in January 343 crossed from Boulogne to Britain, perhaps to repel the Picts and Scots. His rule is admitted to have been, at the outset, vigorous and just, but the promise of his early years was not maintained. His exactions grew more intolerable. 
his private vices more shameless, while his favorites were allowed to violate the laws with impunity. It would seem, however, to have been his unconcealed contempt for the army which caused his fall. A party at court conspired with Marcellinus, count of the sacred largesses, and Magnentius, commander of the picked corps of Joviani and Herculiani, to secure his overthrow. Despite his Roman name, Magnentius was a barbarian. His father had been a slave and subsequently a freedman in the service of Constantine. While at Augustodunum, during the absence of the emperor on a hunting expedition, Marcellinus, on the pretext of a banquet in honor of his son's birthday, feasted the military leaders, 18th of January, 350. Wine had flowed freely, and the night was already far advanced when Magnentius suddenly appeared among the revelers, clad in the purple. He was straightway acclaimed Augustus. The rumors spread. Folk from the countryside poured into the city. Illyrian horsemen, who had been drafted into the Gallic regiments, joined their comrades, while the officers, hardly knowing what was afoot, were carried by the tide of popular enthusiasm into the usurper's camp. Constance fled for Spain, and at the foot of the Pyrenees, by the small frontier fortress of Helene, was murdered by Gaiso, the barbarian emissary of Magnentius. The news of his brother's death reached Constantius when the winter was almost over, but true to his principle never to sacrifice the empire to his own personal advantage, he remained in the east, providing for its safety during his absence and appointing Lucilianus to be commander-in-chief. The hardships and oppression which the provinces had suffered under Constance were turned by Magnentius to good account. A month after his usurpation, Italy had joined him, and Africa was not slow to follow. The army of Illyricum was wavering in its fidelity when, upon the advice of Constantia, sister of Constantius, Vatranio, magister peditum of the forces on the Danube, allowed himself to be acclaimed emperor. March the first at Mursa or Sirmium, and immediately appealed for help to Constantius. The latter recognized the usurper, sent Vetranio a diadem, and gave orders that he should be supported by the troops on the Pannonian frontier. Meanwhile, in Rome, the elect of the mob, Flavius Papilius Nepotianus, cousin of Constantius, enjoined a brief and bloody reign of some twenty-eight days, until, through the treachery of a senator, he fell into the hands of the soldiers of Magnentius, led by Marcellinus, the newly appointed Magister Officiorum. In the east, Nisibis was besieged for the third and last time. Sapir's object was, it would seem, permanently to settle a Persian colony within the city. The siege was pressed with unexampled energy. The Mygdonias was turned from its course, and thus, upon an artificial lake, the fleet plied its rams, but without effect. At length, under the weight of the waters, part of the city wall collapsed. Cavalry and elephants charged to storm the breach. But the huge beasts turned in flight and broke the lines of the assailants. A new wall rose behind the old, and though four months had passed, Jacobus, bishop of Nisibis, never lost heart. Then, Saper learned that the Massagetae were invading his own country, and slowly the Persian host withdrew. For a time, the eastern frontier was at peace. A.D. 350. In the west, while Magnentius sought to win the recognition of Constantius, Vatranio played a waiting game. At last, the historians tell us, the Illyrian emperor broke his promises and made his peace with Magnentius. A common embassy sought Constantius, let him give Magnentius his sister, Constantia, to wife, and himself wed the daughter of Magnentius. Constantius wavered, but rejected the proposals and marched towards Sardica. Vetranio held the pass of Succi, the iron gate of latter times, but on the arrival of the emperor gave way before him. In Nisus, or as others say, in Sirmium, the two emperors mounted a rostrum, and Constantius harangued the troops, 
appealing to them to avenge the death of the son of the great Constantine. The army hailed Constantius alone as Augustus, and Vitranius sought for pardon. The emperor treated the usurper with great respect, and accorded him on his retirement to Prusa in Bithynia a handsome pension until his death six years later. Such is the story, but it can hardly fail to arouse suspicion. The greatest blot on the character of Constantius is his ferocity, when once he fancied his superiority threatened, and here was both treason and treachery, for power had been stolen from him by a trick. All difficulties are removed, if Vitranio throughout never ceased to support Constantius, even though the emperor may have doubted his loyalty for a time when he heard that the prudent general had anticipated any action on the part of Magnentius by himself seizing the key position, the pass of Succi. It is obvious that their secret was worth keeping. It is ill to play with armies, as Constantius and Vitrania had done, while the clemency of an outraged sovereign offered a fair theme to the panegyrists of the emperor. Marching against one usurper in the west, Constantius was anxious to secure the east to the dynasty of Constantine. The recent success of Lucilianus may have appeared dangerously complete. The emperor's nephew Gallus had, it would seem, for some time followed the court, and while at Sirmium, Constantius determined to create him Caesar. At the same time, March 15th, 351, his name was changed into Flavius Claudius Constantius. He was married to Constantia and became Frater Augusti. Forthwith, the prince and his wife started for Antioch. Meanwhile, Magnentius had not been idle. He had raised huge sums of money in Gaul, while Franks, Saxons, and Germans trooped to the support of their fellow countrymen, whose army now outnumbered that of Constantius. The latter, however, took the offensive in the spring of 351, and uniting Vitranio's troops with his own, marched towards the Alpine passes. An ambush of Magnentius posted in the defiles of Atrans inflicted severe loss on his advance guard, and the emperor was compelled to withdraw. Elated by this success, the usurper now occupied Pannonia, and passing Petovio made for Sirmium. Throughout his reign, the policy of Constantius was marked by an anxious desire to husband the military forces of the empire, and even now he was ready to compromise and to avoid the fearful struggle between the armies of Gaul and Illyricum. He dispatched Philippus, offering to acknowledge Magnentius as co-Augustus in the west, if he would abandon any claim to Italy. The ambassador was detained, but his proposals, after some delay, rejected. The usurper was so certain of victory that his envoy, the senator Titianus, could even counsel Constantius to abdicate. An attack of Magnentius on Sicilia was repulsed, and an effort to cross the save was also unsuccessful. Constantius then retired, preferring to await the enemy in open country where he could turn to the best advantage his superiority in cavalry. At Sibale, the army took up an entrenched position, while Magnentius advanced on Sirmium, hoping to meet with no resistance. Foiled in this, he marched to Mursa, in the rear of Constantius' army. The latter was forced to relieve the town, and here, on September 28th, the decisive battle was fought. Behind Constantius flowed the Danube, and on his right the Drave. For him, flight must mean destruction. On both wings he posted mounted archers, and in the forefront the mailed cavalry, cataphracti, which he had himself raised after the Persian model. In the center the heavy-armed infantry were stationed, and in the rear the bowmen and slingers. Before the struggle, Silvanus with his horsemen deserted Magnentius. From late afternoon till far into the night the battle raged. The cavalry of Constantius routed the enemy's right wing, and this drew the whole line into confusion. Magnentius fled, but Marcellinus continued the fight. The Gauls refused to acknowledge defeat. The, 
Some few escaped through the darkness, but thousands were driven into the river or cut down upon the plain. It is said that Magnentius lost 24,000 men, Constantius 30,000. The usurper took refuge in Aquileia and garrisoned the passes of the Alps. Although his overtures were rejected, and though his schemes to murder the Caesar Gallus and thus to raise difficulties for Constantius in the east were foiled, yet the exhaustion of his enemies and the approach of winter made pursuit impossible. Constantius forthwith proclaimed an amnesty for all the adherents of Magnentius, except only those immediately implicated in his brother's murder. Many deserted the pretender and escaped by sea to the victor. In the following year, 352, Constantius forced the passes of the Julian Alps, while his fleet dominated the Po, Sicily, and Africa. At the news, Magnentius fled to Gaul, and by November, the emperor was already in Milan, abrogating all the fugitives' measures. In 353, Constantius crossed the Cardian Alps, and at length, three years and a half after his assumption of the purple, Magnentius was surrounded in Lyon by his own troops, and finding his cause hopeless, committed suicide, while his Caesar, Decentius, also perished by his own hand. End of section 7《Section 8 of Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1, Section 8. Chapter 3. Constantine's Successors to Jovian and the Struggle with Persia, by Norman H. Baines. Part 2. The importance and significance of this unsuccessful bid for empire may easily be overlooked. A Roman civil official at the head of some discontented spirits at the court hatches a plot against his sovereign, and in order to win the support of the army, alienated by the contempt of Constance, induces a barbarian general to declare himself emperor. But though the Roman world was willing enough that Germans should fight the empire's battles in their defense, they were not prepared to see another Maximin upon the throne. They refused to be reconciled to Magnentius even by the admitted justice of his rule. The lesson of his failure was well learned. The barbarian Arbogast caused not himself but the Roman civilian Eugenius to be elected emperor. Further, while in this struggle the eastern and western halves of the empire are seen falling naturally and almost unconsciously asunder, the most powerful force working for unity is the dynastic sentiment. Constantius claims support as the legitimate successor of the house of Constantine, and as the avenger of the death of his son. His claim is not merely as the chosen of the senate or army, but far more as the rightful heir to the throne. This struggle throws into prominence the growth of the hereditary principle and the warmth of the response which it could evoke from the sympathies of the subjects of the empire. No student of the history of the 4th century can indeed afford to neglect the Battle of Mursa. Contemporaries were staggered at the appalling loss of life, for, while it is said that the Roman dead numbered 40,000 at Hadrianople, A.D. 378, at Mursa, 54,000 are reported to have been slain. It is hardly too much to say that the defense of the empire in the east was crippled by this blow, and it must have been largely through the slaughter at Mursa that Constantius was forced to make his fatal demand that the troops of Gaul should march against Persia. Neither must the military significance of the battle be forgotten, it lies in the fact that this was the first victory of the newly formed heavy cavalry, and the result of the impact of their charge, which carried all before it, show that it was no longer the legionary who was to play the most important part in the campaigns of the future. Meanwhile, in Antioch, Gallus was ruling as an oriental despot. There was in his nature a strain of savagery, and his appointment as Caesar seems to have awakened within him a brutal lust for a naked display of unrestrained authority. His passions were only fed by the violence of Constantia, 
the unsuccessful plot of Magnentius to assassinate the Caesar aroused the latter's suspicions, and a reign of terror began. Judicial procedure was disregarded, and informers honored. Men were condemned to death without trial, and the members of the city council imprisoned. When the populace complained of scarcity, it was suggested that the responsibility lay with Theophilus, governor of Syria. The mob took the hint, and the governor perished. The feeling of insecurity was rendered more intense by a rising among the Jews, who declared a certain Patricius their king, and by the raids of Saracens and Azorians upon the countryside. The loyalty of the East was jeopardized. The reports of Thalassius, the Praetorian prefect, and of Barbatio, the Caesar's count of the guard, at length moved Constantius to action. On the death of Thalassius, winter 353-4, the mission was sent to Antioch as his successor, directions being given him that Gallus was to be persuaded to visit the emperor in the west. The prefect studied discourtesy and overbearing behavior enraged the Caesar. The mission was thrown into prison, and the populace, responding to the appeal of Gallus, tore in pieces both the prefect and Montius, the quester of the palace. The trials for Trajan, which followed, were but a parody of justice. Fear and hate held sway in Antioch. Constantius himself now rode to Gallus, praying his presence in Milan. And deep foreboding the Caesar started. On his journey, the death of his wife, the emperor's masterful sister, further dismayed him. And after passing through Constantinople, his guard of honor became his jailers. Stripped of his purple by Barbatio in Petovio, he was brought near Pola before a commission headed by Eusebius, the emperor's chamberlain, and bidden to account for his administration in the east. The court came to the required conclusion, and Gallus was beheaded. Thus, of the house of Constantine there only remained the emperor's cousin, Julian. Born, in all probability, in April 332, the child spent his early years in Constantinople. His mother, Basilina, daughter of the praetorian prefect Anicius Julianus, died only a few months after the birth of her son, while his father, Julius Constantius, younger brother of Constantine the Great, perished in the massacre of 337. From this, Julian was spared by his extreme youth, and was thereupon removed to Nicomedia, and entrusted to the charge of a distant relative by name Eusebius, who was at the time bishop of the city. When seven years of age, his education was undertaken by Mardonius, a Scythian eunuch, perhaps a Goth, who had been engaged by Julian's grandfather to instruct Basilina in the works of Homer and Hesiod. Mardonius had a passionate love for the classical authors, and on his way to school the boy's imagination was fired by the old man's enthusiasm. Already Julian's love for nature was aroused. In the summer he would spend his time on a small estate which had belonged to his grandmother. It lay eight stades from the coast, and contained springs and trees with a garden. Here, free from crowds, he would read a book in peace, looking up now and again upon the ships and the sea, while from an all, he tells us, there was a wide view over the town below, and thence beyond to the capital, the Propontis, and the distant islands. Suddenly, in 341 perhaps, both he and his brother Gallus were banished to Marcellum, a large and lonely imperial castle in Cappadocia, lying at the foot of Mount Argeus. Here, for six years, the two boys lived in seclusion, for none of their friends were allowed to visit them. Julian chaffed bitterly at this isolation. In one of his rare references to this period, he writes, We might have been in a Persian prison with only slaves for our companions. For a time, the suspicions of Constantius seemed to have gained the upper hand. At length, Julian was allowed to visit his birthplace, Constantinople. Here, while studying under Christian teachers as a citizen among citizens, his natural capacity, wit, and sociability rendered him dangerously popular. It was rumored that men were beginning to look upon the young prince as Constantius' successor. He was bidden to return to Nicomedia, 349 perhaps, where he studied philosophy and came under the influence of Libanius, although he was not allowed to attend the latter's lectures. 
the rhetorician dates Julian's conversion to Neoplatonism from this period. The mud-bespattered statues of the gods were set up in the great temple of Julian's soul. At last, in 351, when Gallus was created Caesar, the student was free to go where he would, and the pagan philosophers of Asia Minor seized their opportunity. One and all plotted to secure the complete conversion of the young prince. Adegius and Eusebius at Pergamum, Maximus and Chrysanthius at Ephesus, could hardly content Julian's hunger for the forbidden knowledge. It was at this time, 351-2, to two, when he was twenty years of age, as he himself tells us, that he finally rejected Christianity and was initiated into the mysteries of Mithras. The fall of Gallus, however, implicated the Caesar's brother, and Julian was closely watched and conducted to Italy. For seven months he was kept under guard, and during the six months which he spent in Milan, he had only one interview with Constantius, which was secured through the efforts of the Empress Eusebia. When at length he was allowed to leave the court and was on his way to Asia Minor, the trial of the tribune Marinus and of Africanus, governor of Pannonia Secunda, on a charge of high treason, inspired Constantius with fresh fears and suspicions. Messages reached Julian, ordering his return. But before his arrival at Milan, Eusebia had won from the emperor his permission for Julian to retire to Athens, love of study being in a characteristic which might, with safety, be encouraged in members of the royal house. Men may have seen in this visit to Greece, in 355, but a banishment. To Julian, nursing the perilous secret of his new-found faith, the change must have been pure joy. In Hellas, his true fatherland, he was probably initiated into the Eleusinian mysteries, while he plunged with impetuous intensity into the life of the university. It was not to be for long, for he was soon recalled to sterner activities. Since the death of Gallus, the emperor had stood alone. Although no longer compromised by the excesses of his Caesar, he was still beset by the old problems which appeared to defy solution. At this time, the power of the central government in Gaul had been still further weakened. Here Silvanus, whose timely desertion of Magnentius had contributed to the emperor's success at the Battle of Mursa, had been appointed Magister Peditum. He had won some victories over the Alamanni, but driven into Trezen by court intrigues, had assumed the purple in Cologne and fallen, after a short reign of some twenty-eight days, a victim of treachery. August, September, 355, perhaps. In his own person, Constantius could not take the command at once in Rhaetia and in Gaul, and yet along the whole northern frontier he was faced with danger and difficulty. He was haunted by the continual fear that some capable general might, of his own motion, proclaim himself Augustus, or like Silvanus be hounded into rebellion. A military triumph often advantaged the captain more than his master, and might have but little influence towards kindling anew the allegiance of the provincials. A prince of the royal house could alone, with any hope of success, attempt to raise the imperial prestige in Gaul. It was thus statecraft and no sinister machination against his cousin's life which led Constantius to listen to his wife and treaties. He determined to banish suspicion and disregard the interested insinuations of the court eunuchs. He would make of the philosopher-scholar a Caesar, in whose person the loyalty of the West should find a rallying point, and on whom its devotion might be spent. In the emperor's absence, Julian once more arrived in Milan, summer 355, but to him imperial favor seemed a thing more terrible than royal neglect. Eusebius' summons to be of good courage was of no avail. Only the thought that this was the will of heaven steeled his purpose. Who was he to fight against the gods? After some weeks, on November 6, 355, Julian was clothed with the purple by Constantius and enthusiastically acclaimed as Caesar by the army. Before leaving the court, the Caesar married Helena, the youngest sister of Constantius. The union was dictated by policy, 
and she would seem never to have taken any large place in the life or thought of Julian. The position of affairs in Gaul was critical. Magnentius had withdrawn the armies of the West to meet Constantius, and horde after horde of barbarians had swept across the Rhine. In the north the Salii had taken possession of what is now the province of Brabant. In the south the Alemanni under Gnodomar had defeated the Caesar de Sentius, and had ravaged the heart of Gaul. The rumor ran that Constantius had even freed the Alemanni from their oaths, and had given them a bribe to induce them to invade Roman territory, allowing them to take for their own any land which their swords could win. The story is probably a fabrication of Julian and his friends, but the fact of the barbarian invasion cannot be doubted. In the spring of 354, Constantius crossed the Jura, and marched to the neighborhood of Basil, but the Alamanni, under Gundomad and Vadomar, withdrew, and a peace was concluded. In 355, Arbidio was defeated near the Lake of Constance, and the fall of Silvanus had, for its immediate consequence, the capture of Cologne by the Franks. Forty-five towns, not to speak of lesser posts, had been laid waste, and the valley of the Rhine was lost to the Romans. Three hundred states from the left bank of the river, the barbarians were permanently settled, and their ravages extended for three times that distance. The whole of Elsass was in the hands of the Alamanni. The heads of the municipalities had been carried into slavery. Strasbourg, Brumath, Worms, and Mainz had fallen. All soldiers of Magnentius, who had feared to surrender themselves after their leader's death, roamed as brigands through the countryside and increased the general disorder. On December 1st, 355, Julian left Milan with a guard of 360 soldiers. In Turin he learned of the fall of Cologne, and thence advanced to Vienna, where he spent the winter training with rueful energy for his new vocation of a soldier. For the following year a combined scheme of operations had been projected. While the emperor, advancing from Rhaetia, attacked the barbarians in their own territory, Julian was to act as lieutenant to Marcellus, with directions to guard the approaches into Gaul, and to drive back any fugitives who sought to escape before Constantius. The neutrality of the Alemannic princes in the north had been secured in 354, while internal dissension among the German tribes favored the emperor's plans. The army in Gaul was ordered to assemble at Reims, and Julian accordingly marched from Vienna, reaching Autun on 24th June. That the barbarians should have constantly harried the Caesar's soldiers as they advanced through Auxerre and Troyes only serves to show how completely Gaul had been flooded by the German tribesmen. From Reims, where the scattered troops were concentrated, the army started for Elsass, pursuing the most direct route by Metz and Dieuze and Tabern. Two legions of the rear guard were surprised on the march and were only with difficulty saved from annihilation. At this time, Constantius was doubtless advancing upon the right bank of the Rhine, for Julian at Brumath drove back a body of the Alamanni who were seeking refuge in Gaul. The Caesar then marched by Koblenz through the desolated Rhine Valley to Cologne. This city he recovered and concluded a peace with the Franks. The approach of winter brought the operations to a close, and Julian retired to Saint. Food was scarce and it was difficult to provision the army. The Caesar's best troops, the Scutarii and Gentiles, were therefore stationed in scattered fortresses. The Alamanni had been driven by hunger to continue their raids through Gaul, and hearing of the weakness of the garrison, they suddenly swept down upon Saint. In this heroic defense of the town, Julian won his spurs as a military commander. For thirty days he withstood the attack until the Alamanni retired discomfited. Marcellus had probably already experienced the ambition and vanity of the Caesar, his independence and intolerance of criticism. An imperial prince was none too agreeable lieutenant. The general may even have considered that the emperor would not be deeply grieved if the fortune of war removed a possible menace to the throne. Whatever his reasons may have been, he treacherously failed to come to the relief of the besieged. When the news reached the court, he was recalled and deprived of his command. Eutherius, sent by Julian from Gaul, discredited the calumnies of Marcellus, 
and Constantius silenced the malignant whispers of the court. Accepting his Caesar's protestations of loyalty, he created him supreme commander over the troops in Gaul. The actual gains won by the military operations of the year 356 may not have been great, but that their moral effect was considerable is demonstrated by the campaign of 357 and by the spirit of the troops at the Battle of Strasbourg. Above all, Julian was no longer an imperial figurehead. He now begins an independent career as general and administrator. In the spring of 357, Constantius, wishing to celebrate with high pomp and ceremony the twentieth year of his rule since the death of Constantine, visited Rome for the first time, April 28th to May 29th. The city filled him with awe and wonder, and he caused an obelisk to be raised in the Circus Maximus as a memorial of his stay in the capital. But to the historian, the main interest of his visit lies in the fact that, as a Christian emperor, Constantius removed from the Senate House the altar of victory. To the whole-hearted pagans, this altar came to stand for a symbol of the Holy Roman Empire, as they conceived it. It was an outward and visible sign of that bond which none might lose between Rome's hard-won greatness as a conquering nation and her loyalty to her historic faith. They clung to it with passionate devotion, and to a time-honored creed in stone, a creed at once political and religious, and thus again and again they struggled and pleaded for its retention or its restoration. The deeper meaning of what might seem a matter of trifling import must never be forgotten if we are to understand the earnest petition of Symmachus or the scorn of Ambrose. The pagan was defending the last trench, the destruction of the altar of victory meant for him that he could hold the fortress no longer. From Rome, the emperor was summoned to the Danube to take action against the Sarmatians, Suevi, and Quadi. He was unable to cooperate with Julian in person, but dispatched Barbatio, Magister Peditum, to Gaul in command of 25,000 troops. Julian was to march from the north, Barbatio was to make Augst near Basel his base of operations, and between the two forces the barbarians were to be enclosed. The choice of a general, however, foredoomed the plan of campaign to failure. Barbatio, one of the principal agents in the death of Gallus, was the last man to work in harmony with Julian. The Caesar, leaving Saint, concentrated his forces, only 13,000 strong, at Reims, and, as in the previous year, marched south to Alsace. Finding the pass of Taber blocked, he drove the barbarians before him and forced them to take refuge in the islands of the Rhine. Barbatio had previously allowed a marauding band of Letai, laden with booty, to pass his camp and to cross the Rhine unscathed, and later, by false reports, had secured the dismissal of the tribunes by Nobodies and the future emperor Valentinian, whom Julian had ordered to dispute the robber's return. He now refused to supply the Caesar with boats. Light-armed troops, however, waded across the Rhine to the islands, and seizing the barbarians' canoes, massacred the fugitives. After this success, Julian fortified the pass of Zabern, and thus closed the gate into Gaul. He settled garrisons in Alsace along the frontier line, and did all in his power to supply them with provisions, for Barbatio withheld all the supplies which arrived from southern Gaul. Having now secured his position, Julian received the amazing intelligence that Barbatio had been surprised by the Germans, had lost his whole baggage train, and had retreated in confusion to Augst, where he had gone into winter quarters. It must be confessed that this defeat of 25,000 men by a sudden barbarian foray seems almost inexplicable, unless it be that Barbatio was determined at all costs to refuse in any way to cooperate with the Caesar and was surprised while on the march to Augst. Julian's position was one of great danger. The emperor was far distant on the Danube. The Alamanni, previously at variance among themselves, were now reunited. Gundamad, the faithful ally of Rome, had been treacherously murdered, and the followers of Valdemar had joined their fellow countrymen. Barbatio's defeat had raised the enemy's hopes, while Julian was unsupported, and had only some 13,000 men under his command. 
It was at this critical moment that a host of Alemannic tribesmen crossed the Rhine under the leadership of Nodomar and encamped, it would seem, on the left bank of the river, close to the city of Strasbourg, which the Romans had apparently not yet recovered. On the third day after the passage of the stream had begun, Julian learned of the movement of the barbarians, and set out from Zabern on the military road to Brumath, and thence on the highway which ran from Strasbourg to Mainz towards Weitbruch. Here, after a march of six or seven hours, the army would reach the frontier fortification, and from this point they had to descend by rough and unknown paths into the plain. On sight of the enemy, despite the counsels of the Caesar, despite their long march and the burning heat of an August day, the troops insisted on an immediate attack. The Roman army was drawn up for battle. Severus on rising ground on the left wing, Julian in command of the cavalry on the right wing in the plain. Severus from this point of vantage discovered an ambush and drove off the barbarians with loss, but the Alamanni, in their turn, routed the Roman horse. Although Julian was successful in staying their flight, they were too demoralized to renew the conflict. The whole brunt of the attack was therefore borne by the Roman center and left wing, and it was a struggle of footmen against footmen. At length the stubborn endurance of the Roman infantry carried the day, and the Alamanni were driven headlong backwards toward the Rhine. Their losses were enormous, six thousand left dead on the field of battle, and countless others drowned. Nodomar was at last captured, and Julian sent the redoubtable chieftain as a prisoner to Constantius. The victory meant the recovery of the Upper Rhine and the freeing of Gaul from barbarian incursions. There would even seem to have been an attempt after the battle to hail Julian as Augustus, but this he immediately repressed. The booty and captives were sent to Metz, and the Caesar himself marched to Mainz, being compelled to subdue a mutiny on the way. The army had apparently been disappointed in its share of the spoil. Julian at once proceeded to cross the Rhine opposite Mainz and to conduct a campaign on the main. His aim would seem to have been to strike still deeper terror into the vanquished, and to secure his advantage in order that he might feel free to turn to the work which awaited him in the north. Three chieftains sued for peace after their land had been laid waste with fire and sword, and to seal this success, Julian rebuilt a fortress which Trajan had constructed on the right bank of the Rhine. The great difficulty which faced the Caesar was the question of supplies, and one of the terms of the ten months' armistice granted to the Alamanni was that they should furnish the garrison of the Munimentum Traiani with provisions. It was this pressing necessity which demanded both an assertion of the power of Rome among the peoples dwelling about the mouths of the Moise and Rhine, and also the re-establishment of the regular transport of corn from Britain. During the campaign on the main, Severus had been sent north to reconnoitre. The Franks now occupied a position of virtual independence in the district south of the Moise, and in the absence of Roman garrisons, and with the Caesar fully occupied by the operations against the Alamanni, a troop of six hundred Frankish warriors were devastating the countryside. They retired before Severus and occupied two deserted fortresses. Here, for fifty-four days, in December 357 and January 358, they were besieged by Julian, who had marched north to support the Magister Equitum. Hunger compelled them at last to yield, for the relief sent by their fellow tribesmen arrived too late. Julian spent the winter in Paris, and in early summer advanced with great speed and secrecy, surprised the Franks in Toxandria, and forced them to acknowledge Roman supremacy. Further north, the Camavi had been driven by the pressure of the Saxons in their rear to cross the Rhine and to take possession of the country between that river and the Moise. The cooperation of Severus enabled Julian to force them to submission, and it would appear that in consequence they retired to their former homes on the Isel. The lower Rhine was now once more in Roman hands. The generalship of Julian had achieved what the prefect Florentius had deemed that Roman gold could alone secure, and the building of a fleet of four hundred sea-going vessels was at once begun. The lower Rhine secured, 
Julian forthwith, July and August, returned to his unfinished task in the south. It was imperative that the ravaged provinces of Gaul should be repeopled. Their desolation and the honor of the empire alike demanded that the prisoners in the hands of the barbarians should be restored. The remorseless ravaging of his land compelled Horterius to yield, to surrender his Roman captives, and to furnish timber for the rebuilding of the Roman towns. The winter passed, Julian once more left Paris, and with his new fleet brought the corn of Britain to the garrisons of the Rhine. Seven fortresses, from Castra Hercules in the land of the Batavi to Bingen in the south, were reconstructed, and then, in a last campaign against the most southerly tribes of the Alamanni, those chieftains who had taken a leading part in the Battle of Strasbourg were forced to tender their submission. It was no easy matter to secure the release of the Roman prisoners, but Julian could claim to have restored 20,000 of these unfortunates to their homes. The Caesar's work was done. Gaul was once more in peace, and the Rhine the frontier of the empire. End of section 8. Section 9 of Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1, Section 9, Chapter 3, Constantine's Successors to Jovian and the Struggle with Persia by Norman H. Baines. When we turn to Julian's action in the civil affairs of the West, our information is all too scanty. It is clear that he approached his task with a passionate conviction that at all costs he would relieve the lot of the oppressed provincials. He took part in person in the administration of justice, and himself revised the judgments of provincial governors. He refused to grant indulgences, whereby arrears of taxation were remitted, for he well knew that these imperial acts of grace benefited the rich alone. For wealth, when first the tribute was assessed, could purchase the privilege of delay, and thus in the end enjoy the relief of the general rebate. He resolutely opposed all extraordinary burdens, and when Florentius persistently urged him to sign a paper imposing additional taxation for war purposes, he threw the document indignantly to the ground, and all the remonstrances of the prefect were without avail. In Belgica, the Caesar's own representatives collected the tribute, and the inhabitants were saved from the exactions alike of the agents of the prefect and of the governor. So successful was his administration, that where previously for the land tax alone twenty-five ore had been exacted, seven ore only were now demanded by the state. But reform was slow, and in Julian's character there was a strain of restless impatience. He was intolerant of delays, and of the irrational obstacles that barred the highway of progress. It galled him that he could not appoint as officials and subordinates men after his own heart admitted that Constantius sent him capable civil servants. Yet these men, who were to be the agents of reform, were themselves members of the corrupt bureaucracy which was ruining the provinces. Indeed, might these nominees of his cousin be withstood? The undefined limits of his office might always render it an open question whether the assertion of the Caesar's right were not aggression upon imperial privilege. Julian's conscious power and burning enthusiasm felt the cruel curb of his subordination. Constantius wished loyally to support his young relative, had given him the supreme command in Gaul after the first trial year, and was determined that he should be supported by experienced generals. But Julian was far distant, and his enemies at court had the emperor's ear. For them his successes and virtues but rendered him the more dangerous. The eunuch gang, says Ammianus, only worked the harder at the smithies where calumnies were forged. At times they mocked the Caesar's vanity, and decried his conquests. At others they played upon the suspicions of Constantius. Julian was victor today. Why not another Victorinus, an upstart emperor of Gaul, tomorrow? Imperial messengers to the west were careful to bring back ominous reports, and Julian, who knew how matters stood, and was not ignorant of his cousin's failings, 
may well have feared the overmastering influence of the emperor's advisers. Thus constantly checked in his plans of reform alike religious and political, already it may be hailed as Augustus by his soldiery and dreading the machinations of courtiers, he began at first, perhaps in spite of himself, to long for greater independence. In 359 he was dreaming of the time when he should be no longer Caesar. The war in the east gave him his opportunity. While Julian had been recovering Gaul, Constantius had been engaged in a series of campaigns on the Danube frontier, and for this purpose had removed his court from Milan to Sirmium. An unimportant expedition against the Suevi in Rhaetia in 357 was followed in 358 by lengthy operations in the plains about the Danube and the Thais against the Cardi and various Sarmatian tribes who had burst plundering across the border. The barbarian territory was ravaged, and through the emperor's successful diplomacy, one people after another submitted and surrendered their prisoners. They were, in most cases, left in possession of their lands under the supremacy of Rome, but the Limigantes were forced to settle on the left instead of the right bank of the Tith, while the Samate Liberi were given a king by Constantius, in the person of their native prince Zizais, and were themselves restored to the district which the Limigantes had been compelled to leave. The latter, however, in the following year, 359, discontented with their new homes, craved that they might be allowed to cross the Danube and settle within the empire. This Constantius was persuaded to permit, hoping thus to gain recruits for the Roman army, and thereby to lighten the burdens of the provincials. The Limigantes, once admitted upon Roman territory, sought to avenge themselves for the losses of the previous year by a treacherous onslaught upon the emperor. Constantius escaped, and a general massacre of the faithless barbarians ensued. The pacification of the northern frontier was now complete. Meanwhile, in the east, hostilities with Persia had ceased on any large scale since 351, and in 356 to 357 the prefect Musonianus had been carrying on negotiations for peace through Cassianus, military commander in Mesopotamia, with Tampsapur, a neighbouring satrap. But the moment was inopportune. Sapor himself had at length effected an alliance with the Chionite and Gelani, and now, spring 358, in a letter to the emperor, demanded the restoration of Mesopotamia and Armenia. In case of refusal, he threatened military action in the following year. Constantius proudly rejected the shameful proposal, but sent two successive embassies to Persia in the hope of concluding an honourable peace. The effort was fruitless. Court intrigue deprived Ursicinus, Rome's one really capable general in the east, of the supreme command, and in spite of the prayers of the provincials, he was succeeded by Sabinianus, who in his obscure old age was distinguished only by his wealth, inefficiency, and credulous piety. During the entire course of the war, inactivity was the one prominent feature of his generalship. On the outbreak of hostilities in 359, the Persians adopted a new plan of campaign. A rich Syrian, Antoninus by name, who had served on the staff of the general commanding in Mesopotamia, was threatened by powerful enemies with ruin. Having compiled from official sources full information alike as to Rome's available ammunition and stores and the number of her troops, he fled with his family to the court of Sapor. Here, welcomed and trusted, he counselled immediate action. Men had been withdrawn from the east, for the campaigns on the Danube. Let the king no longer be content with frontier forays, let him without warning strike for the rich province of Syria, unravaged since the days of Gallienus. The deserter's advice was adopted by the Persians. On the advance of their army, however, the Romans, withdrawing from Chere and the open countryside, burned down all vegetation over the whole of northern Mesopotamia. This devastation and the swollen stream of the Euphrates forced the Persians to strike northward through Sophin. Sapor crossed the river higher in its course and marched towards Amida. The city refused to surrender, and the death of the son of Grumbates, king of the Chionite, provoked Sapor to abandon his attack on Syria and to press the siege. Six legions formed the standing garrison, a force which probably numbered some six thousand men in all. But at the time of the Persian advance, the country folk had all assembled for the yearly market, and when the peasantry fled for refuge within the city walls, Amida was densely overcrowded. None, however, dreamed of surrender. 
Ammianus, one of the besieged, has left us a vivid account of those heroic seventy-three days. In the end, the city fell, 6th October, and its inhabitants were either slain or carried into captivity. Winter was now approaching, and Sir Paul was forced to return to Persia with the loss of 30,000 men. The sacrifice of Amida had saved the eastern provinces of the Roman Empire, but the fall of the city also convinced Constantius that more troops were needed if Rome was to withstand the enemy. Accordingly, the emperor sent by the tribune Decentius his momentous order that the auxiliary troops, the Eruli Batavi Celtae and Petulantes, should leave Gaul forthwith, and with them three hundred men from each of the remaining Gallic regiments. The demand reached Julian in Paris, where he was spending the winter, probably January 360, and for him the serious feature of the dispatch was that the execution of the emperor's command was entrusted to Lupincinus and Gintonius, while Julian himself was ignored. The transference of the troops was probably an imperial necessity, but this could not justify the form of the emperor's dispatch. The unrelenting malice of the courtiers had carried the day. Constantius seems to have lost confidence in his Caesar. At first, Julian thought to lay down his office. Then he temporized. He professed that obedience to the emperor would imperil the safety of the province. He raised the objection that the barbarians had enlisted on the understanding that they should never be called upon to serve beyond the Alps. Lupincinus was in Britain fighting the Picts and Scots, while Florentius, to whose influence rumour ascribed the emperor's action, was absent in Vienne. Julian summoned him to Paris to give his advice, but the prefect pleaded the urgency of the supervision of the corn supply and remained where he was. While Julian played a waiting game, a timely broadsheet was found in the camp of the Celtae and Petulantes. The anonymous author complained that the soldiers were being dragged none knew whither, leaving their families to be captured by the Alemanni. The partisans of Constantius saw the danger. Should Julian still delay, they insisted, he would but justify the emperor's suspicions. His hand was forced. He wrote a letter to Constantius, ordered the soldiers to leave their winter quarters, and gave permission for their families to accompany them. Sintula, the Caesar's tribune of the stable, at once set out for the east with a picked body of Gentiles and Scutari, unwisely as events proved. The court party demanded that the troops should march through Paris. There, they thought, any disaffection could be repressed. Julian met the men outside the city and spoke them fair. Their officers he invited to a banquet in the evening. But when the guests had returned to their quarters, there suddenly arose in the camp a passionate shout, and crowding tumultuously to the palace, the soldiers surrounded its walls, raising the fateful acclamation, Julianus Augustus. Without, the army clamoured. Within his room, its leader wrestled with the gods until the dawn, and with the break of a new day, he was assured of heaven's blessing. When he came forth to face his men, he might attempt to dissuade them, but he knew that he would bow to their will. Raised upon a shield, and crowned with a standard-bearer's talk, the Caesar returned to his palace an emperor. But now that the irrevocable step was taken, his resolution seemed to have failed, and he remained in retirement, perhaps for some days. The adherents of Constantius took heart, and a group of conspirators plotted against Julian's life. But the secret was not kept, and the soldiers once more encircled the palace, and would not be contented until they had seen their emperor alive and well. From this moment, Julian stifled his scruples, and accepted accomplished fact. After the flight of Decentius and Florentius, he dispatched Eutherius and his Magister Officinorum Pentarius as ambassadors to Constantius, while in his letter he proposed the terms which he was prepared to make the basis of a compromise. He would send to the east troops raised from the Deditici, and the Romans settled on the left bank of the Rhine. To withdraw the Gallic troops would be, he professed, to endanger the safety of the province, while Constantius should allow him to appoint his own officials, both military and civil, save only that the nomination of the Praetorian prefect should rest with the elder Augustus, whose superior authority Julian avowed himself willing to acknowledge. When the news from Paris reached Caesarea, Constantius hesitated. Should he march forthwith against his rebellious Caesar and desert the east, while the Persians were threatening to renew the attack of the previous year, or should he subordinate his personal quarrel to the interests of the state? Loyalty to his conception of an emperor's duty carried the day, and he advanced to Edessa. The fact that the Persians in this year were able to recover Singara, once more fallen into Roman hands, and to capture and garrison Bizabdeh, 
a fortress on the Tigris in Zabdicine, while the emperor remained perforce inactive, served to show how very earnest was his need of troops. Even the attempt to recover Bizabde in the autumn was unsuccessful. Meanwhile, Constantius, ignoring Julian's proposals, made several nominations to high officers in the west, and dispatched Leonus to bid the rebel lay aside the purple with which a turbulent soldiery had invested him. The letter, when read to the troops, served but to inflame their enthusiasm for their general, and Leonus fled for his life. But Julian still hoped that an understanding between himself and Constantius was even now not impossible. To save his army from inaction, he led them not towards the east, but against the Atuarian Franks on the lower Rhine. The barbarians, unwarned of the Roman approach, were easily defeated, and peace was granted on their submission. The campaign lasted three months, and thence, by Basel and Besançon, Julian returned to winter at Vienne, for Paris, his beloved Lutetia, lay at too great a distance from Asia. Letters were still passing between himself and Constantius, but his task lay clear before him. He must be forearmed alike for aggression and defence. By a display of power, he sought to wrest from his cousin recognition and acknowledgement, while, with his troops about him, he could at least sustain his cause and escape the shame of his brother's fate. Recruits from the barbarian tribes swelled his forces, and large sums of money were raised for the coming campaign. In the spring of 361, Julian, by the treacherous capture and banishment of Vadomar, removed all fears of an invasion by the Alemanni, and about the month of July, set out from Basel for the east. By this step he took the aggressive, and himself finally broke off the negotiations. This was avowed by his appointment of a prefect of Gaul in place of Nebridius, the nominee of Constantius, who had refused to take the oath of allegiance to Julian. Germanianus temporarily performed the prefect's duties, but retired in favour of Sallust, while Nevita was created Magister Amorum, and Jovius Questor. As soon as he was freed from the Persian war, Constantius had thought to hunt down his usurping Caesar and capture his prey while Julian was still in Gaul. He had set guards about the frontiers, and had stored corn on the lake of Constance, and in the neighbourhood of the Cochian Alps. Julian determined that he would not wait to be surrounded, but would strike the first blow, while the greater part of the army of Illyricum was still in Asia. He argued that present daring might deliver Simium into his hands, that thereupon he could seize the pass of Sutki, and thus be master of the road to the west. Jovius and Jovinus were ordered to advance at full speed through North Italy, in command, it would appear, of a squadron of cavalry. They would thus surprise the inhabitants into submission, while fear of the main army, which would follow more slowly, might overawe opposition. Nevita, he commanded, to make his way through Rhaetia Mediterranea, while he himself left Basel with but a small escort, and struck direct through the Black Forest for the Danube. Here he seized the vessels of the river fleet, and at once embarked his men. Without rest or intermission, Julian continued the voyage down the river, and reached Bononia on the eleventh day. Under the cover of night, Dagalaifus, with some picked followers, was dispatched to Sirmium. At dawn, his troop was demanding admission in the emperor's name. Only when too late was the discovery made that the emperor was not Constantius. The general, Lucilianus, who had already begun the leisurely concentration of his men for an advance into Gaul, was rudely aroused from sleep and hurried away to Bononia. The gates of Sirmium, the northern capital of the empire, were opened, and the inhabitants poured forth to greet the victor of Strasbourg. Two days only did Julian spend in the city, then marched to Suki, left Nevita to guard the pass, and retired to Nysus, where he spent the winter awaiting the arrival of his army. Julian's march from Gaul meant the final breach with Constantius. His present task was to justify his usurpation to the world. Thus the imperial pamphleteer was born. One apologia followed another, now addressed to the Senate, now to Athens as representing the historic centre of Hellenism, now to some city whose allegiance Julian sought to win. But he overshot the mark. The painting of the character of Constantius men felt to be a caricature, and the scandalous portraiture unworthy of one who owed his advancement to his cousin's favours. Meanwhile, Julian strained every nerve to raise more troops for the coming campaign. He was not yet strong enough to advance into Thrace to meet the forces under Count Marcianus, and the news from the west forced him to realise how critical his position might become. Two legions and a cohort stationed in Simium he did not dare to trust, 
and so gave the command that they should march to Gaul to take the place of those regiments which formed part of his own army. On the long journey the men's discontent grew to mutiny. Refusing to advance, they occupied Aquileia and were supported by the inhabitants who had remained at heart loyal to Constantius. The danger was very real. The insurgents might form a nucleus of disaffection in Italy and thus imperil Julian's retreat. He gave immediate orders to Juvenus to return and to employ in the siege of Aquileia, the whole of the main force now advancing through Italy. In the east, Constantius had marched to Edessa, spring 361, where he awaited information as to the plans of Sapor. It was only on the news of Julian's capture of the pass of Suki that he felt that the war in the west could no longer be postponed. At the same time, Constantius learned of Sapor's retreat, since the auspices forbade the passage of the Tigris. The Roman army, assembled at Hierapolis, greeted the emperor's harangue with enthusiasm. Abitio was dispatched in advance to bar Julian's progress through Thrace, and when Constantius had made provision in Antioch for the government of the east, he started in person against the usurper. Fever, however, attacked him in Tarsus, and his illness was rendered still more serious by the violent storms of late autumn. At Mopsucrene in Cilicia, he died on 3rd November 361, at the age of 44. Ammianus Marcellinus has given us a definitive sketch of the character of Constantius. His faults are clear as day. To guard the emperor from treason, Diocletian had made the throne unapproachable, but this severance of sovereign and people drove the ruler back on the narrow circle of his ministers. They were at once his informants and his advisers. Their lord learned only that which they deemed it well for him to know. The emperor was led by his favourites. Constantius possessed considerable influence, writes Ammianus in bitter irony, with his eunuch chamberlain Eusebius. The insinuations of courtiers ultimately sowed mistrust between his Caesar Julian and himself. They played upon the suspicious nature of the emperor, their whispers of treason fired him to senseless ferocity, and the services of brave men were lost to the empire lest their popularity should endanger the monarch's peace. Even loyal subjects grew to doubt whether the emperor's safety were worth its fearful price. To maintain the extravagant pomp of his rapacious ministers and followers, the provinces laboured under an overwhelming weight of taxes and impositions which were exacted with merciless severity, while the public post was ruined by the constant journeying of bishops from one council to another. Yet though these dark features of the reign of Constantius are undeniable, below his inhuman repression of those who had fallen under the suspicion of treason, lay a deep conviction of the solemnity of the trust which had been handed down to him from father and grandfather. For Constantius, the consciousness that he was representative by the grace of heaven of a hereditary dynasty carried with it its obligation, and the task of maintaining the greatness of Rome was subtly confused with the duty of self-preservation since a usurper's reign would never be hallowed by the seal of a legitimate succession. With a sense of this responsibility, Constantius always sought to appoint only tried men to important offices in the state. He consistently exalted the civil element at the expense of the military, and rigidly maintained the separation between the two services, which had been one of the leading principles of Diocletian's reforms. Sober and temperate, he possessed that power of physical endurance, which was shared by so many of his house. In his early years he served as lieutenant to his father alike in east and west, and gained a wide experience of men and cities. Now on this frontier, now on that, he was constantly engaged in the empire's defence. A soldier by necessity, a no-born general, he was twice hailed by his men with the title of Sarmaticus, and in the usurpations of Magnentius and of Julian he refused to hazard the safety of the provinces and loyally sacrificed all personal interests in face of the higher claims of his duty to the Roman world. He was naturally cold and self-contained. He fails to awake our affection or our enthusiasm, but we can hardly withhold our tribute of respect. He bore his burden of empire with high seriousness. Men were conscious in his presence of an overmastering dignity and of a majesty which inspired them with something akin to awe. By the death of Constantius, the empire was happily freed from the horrors of another civil war. Julian was clearly marked out to be his cousin's successor, and the decision of the army did not admit of doubt. Eusebius and the court party were forced to abandon any idea of putting forward another claimant to the throne. Two officers, Theolaphus and Aligildus, 
bore the news to Julian. Fortune had intervened to favour his rash adventure, and he at once advanced through Thrace by Philippopolis to Constantinople. Agilo was dispatched to Aquileia, and at length the besieged were convinced of the emperor's death, and thereupon their stubborn resistance came to an end. Nigrinus, the ringleader, and two others were put to death, but soldiers and citizens were fully pardoned. When, on 11th December 361, Julian, still but thirty-one years old, entered the sole emperor his eastern capital, all eyes were turned in wondering amazement on the youthful hero, and for the rest of his life upon him alone was fixed the gaze of Roman historians. Wherever Julian is not, there we are left in darkness of the West, for example, we know next to nothing. The history of Julian's reign becomes perforce the biography of the emperor. In that biography, three elements are all important. Julian's passionate determination to restore the pagan worship, his earnest desire that men should see a new Marcus Aurelius upon the throne, and that abuses and maladministration should hide their heads ashamed before an emperor who was also a philosopher, and in the last place, his tragic ambition to emulate the achievements of Alexander the Great, and by a crushing blow to assert over Persia the preeminence of Rome. End of section 9